Hello. In this video, we are going to discuss limits, both the concept of a limit, but also how to compute and evaluate limits. If you are asked to find the limit of a function, this means that you need to find out what happens to that function as x gets really, really close, but not equal to a certain x value. This is an extremely important concept in calculus, but also mathematics in general. We're going to see a number of examples of how to compute limits, but first let's take a closer look at the concept of what a limit is. Suppose f is a function and a is a real number. The expression the limit of f of x as x goes to a is equal to l, or another way of writing that is f of x approaches l as x approaches a. This means that the values of f of x, in other words the y values, are as close as we like to l for all x sufficiently close to a on either side of a, but not necessarily when x is equal to a. This might sound complicated, so let's take a look at what it means in a graphical example. So here we have a graph and we can see that the limit as x goes to 4 is equal to 8. The sentence, the values of f of x are as close as we like to L for all x sufficiently close to 4, means that if you choose a certain distance from L on the y-axis, then it's possible to specify corresponding distance from 4 on the x-axis, so that for all x in that interval, the curve lies within this rectangle. Even if you specify a smaller distance from L on the y-axis, it's still possible to find a corresponding distance on the x-axis so that the curve lies within that rectangle. In effect, what this means is that for all x values close to 4, the y values are going to be close to 8. Here's another graphical example of a limit. Looking at the graph of this function, we can see that near x equals to 4, the y values are going to be near 3. This means that the limit is going to be equal to 3. It doesn't matter that f of 4 is equal to 6, because the limit only deals with x values that are close to 4, not necessarily x equals to 4. In this graphical example, let's have a look at the limit of f of x as x goes to 1. Looking at the graph of this function, we see that there isn't a particular y value that the curve approaches as x gets close to 1. This means that this limit does not exist. For the limit to exist, there would have to be one particular y value that the curve approaches both from the left and from the right. Here we are looking at the limit of x times sine 1 over x as x goes to 0. This limit is going to be equal to 0. Even though the function itself is undefined when x is equal to 0, we can see in the graph that if x is near 0, then the y values are going to be near 0 as well. So the limit as x goes to 0 of this function is equal to 0. Okay. We've now seen a number of examples of using graphs to look at limits, but it's not always possible to look at a graph to find the limit of a function. In fact, graphs can actually be misleading or imprecise or even give you an incorrect answer sometimes. So if you're asked to find the limit of a function, it's important that you do that using algebraic computations rather than looking at the graph of a function. Here are some basic facts that are going to help us with that. Suppose that c is any real number and n is a positive integer. Then the limit of x to the power of n as x goes to c is equal to c to the power of n. In other words, you can just insert x equals to c. In fact, if p of x is any polynomial, then the limit of p of x as x goes to c is equal to p of c. In other words, you just insert x equals to c. This also works for rational functions, provided that you don't have division by zero. So if p and q are polynomials, and q of c is not equal to zero, then you can just insert x equals to c to find the limit. Here's our first computational example. We're trying to find the limit of this rational function as x goes to 1. Notice that if we insert x equals to 1 into the denominator, we do not get 0. This means that there is no division by 0, and so to evaluate this limit, all we need to do is insert x equals to 1 in the entire expression, simplify, and the answer is equal to 1. In this example, we're evaluating the limit of another rational function, this time as x goes to 3. Let's insert x equals to 3 into the denominator. This time we do get 0. This means that we cannot simply insert x equals to 3 into the expression. The trick in this case is to factor. We're going to factor x to the power of 4 minus 81. It becomes x squared minus 9 times x squared plus 9. 
and the denominator factors as x minus 3 times x plus 6. We can actually factor these even further. x squared minus 9 becomes x minus 3 times x plus 3. Now notice that x minus 3 cancels out. Now we have no division by 0 anymore, so now we can actually insert x equals to 3 into the expression. We simplify and the final answer is 12. Here we have the limit of a piecewise defined function as x goes to negative 4. If x is near negative 4, this means that f of x is equal to 2x squared plus 4x minus 16 divided by x plus 4. So this is the expression that we should use to calculate the limit. We should factor the numerator to get 2x plus 8 times x minus 2. Factor even further by taking out a common 2. Now we see that x plus 4 cancels. This means that we no longer have division by 0, so we can insert x equals to negative 4, simplify, and the final answer is negative 12. Before moving on to the next example, let's have a look at the graph of this function. We've just calculated that the limit is equal to negative 12. It's not equal to negative 10. This is because the limit deals with what happens when x is near negative 4. It doesn't matter what happens when x is actually equal to negative 4. Here we have the limit of 2 square root of x minus 6 divided by x minus 9 as x goes to 9. Notice that in this case we do have division by 0, so we need to somehow rewrite this expression. The trick in this case is to multiply top and bottom by the conjugate. 2 square root of x plus 6 divided by 2 square root of x plus 6. We're not changing the value of this fraction because we're multiplying top and bottom by the same number, the same expression. The numerators, when you multiply them out, becomes 4x minus 36. And the denominators, we're going to leave those factored for now. Factoring out a 4 from the numerator, we see that x minus 9 cancels out. This is precisely what we wanted because now there's no division by 0 anymore. Now we can simply insert x equals to 9, compute the final answer, which is 1 over 3. Here we have a limit as x goes to 0, and again we have division by 0, so we need to somehow rewrite this expression. In this case, the numerator consists of several smaller quotients, so we have smaller quotients within the bigger quotient. The idea here is to put those on a common denominator. So we have 2 minus x plus 2 divided by 2 times x plus 2. Rewriting this, simplifying the very top numerator, we get negative x. Dividing by square root of x is the same as multiplying by 1 over square root of x. Now, negative x divided by square root of x becomes negative square root of x in the numerator. Now there's no longer any division by 0, so we can insert x equals to 0 and compute the final answer, which is 0. Next is a theorem that will help us evaluate certain types of limits. Suppose that we have three functions, f, g, and h so that f is the smallest and h is the biggest, at least when x is near a, except it doesn't matter what happens when x is equal to a. Also suppose that the limit of f of x as x goes to a is equal to l, and the limit of h is the same number, also equal to l. Then g of x is going to be squeezed or sandwiched between f and h, so the only possible value for this limit is l. Here's an example using the squeeze theorem to evaluate a limit. First we need to create those three functions, f, g, and h. Notice that cosine of any number is between plus and minus 1. We are now trying to make the middle portion of this more similar to the expression in the limit. Therefore we should multiply all three sides of this expression by x to the power of 4. Now to make it more similar to the expression in, in the limit, we need to add 2 to all three sides. We're allowed to do this as long as we do the same to all three sides. Now let's compute the limits of the smallest and the largest of these three expressions. So the limits of negative x to the power of 4 plus 2 as x goes to 0 is equal to 2. The limit of the largest expression is also equal to 2. This means that the middle expression is going to be squeezed between 2 and 2 and the only way for it to go is for the limit to be equal to 2. Now we've seen several techniques and tricks for evaluating limits. So let's summarize some of the strategies that we've seen. 
Direct substitution can be used when there is no division by zero. We've seen examples of factoring, uh, common denominators, they can often be used when you have multiple quotients within a bigger quotient. Multiplying by a conjugate, this is often used for when you have a square root plus or minus a number. And the square root could be either in the numerator or in the denominator. We've also seen the squeeze theorem. This is often used when you have functions involving cosine or sine, but there are other examples as well. So we've seen many examples of computing limits. As I mentioned earlier on, limits is a foundational topic in calculus and many parts of mathematics. For example, derivatives and integrals are defined using limits. So without limits, we would not be able to consider those concepts and things like velocities and many other topics in mathematics and other sciences as well depend on limits. I hope that you found this uh, video useful. Please have a look at our practice problems as well. Good luck. to negative 4, simplify and the final answer is to negative 12. Hi, in this video we will discuss basic differentiation rules. Recall that the derivative of a function at a point is defined as the limit of slopes of secant lines, but computing the derivative from its definition can be a long and a complicated process. Instead, we can use differentiation rules, which can be derived from the definition of the derivative as a limit. These rules can be used to quickly differentiate many commonly used functions. Let's begin by presenting seven basic rules, without proof. If c and alpha are real numbers, then c prime, the derivative of a constant function, is equal to zero. The derivative of x to the alpha is equal to alpha times x to the alpha minus 1. This is called the power rule. The derivative of e to the x is equal to e to the x. If f and g are two differentiable functions, then we have the following. The derivative of c times f is equal to c times the derivative of f, where c is a constant number. The derivative of f plus or minus g is equal to the derivative of f plus or minus the derivative of g. The derivative of f times g is equal to the derivative of f times g plus f times the derivative of g. This is the product rule. And finally, the derivative of f divided by g at x is equal to f prime of x times g of x minus f of x times g prime of x divided by g of x squared. This is the quotient rule. Now let's try out a few examples. Differentiate the function y equals 5x cubed plus x. This function is the sum of two functions, and so the derivative y prime will be equal to the derivative of 5x cubed plus the derivative of x. According to the power rule, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared, and the derivative of x is 1. So when we combine these results, we get 15x squared plus 1. 
differentiate the function y equals square root of x plus 5 to the 4. Note that this function can be written as x to the 1 half plus 5 to the 4. According to the power rule, the derivative of x to the 1 half would be 1 half times x to the negative 1 half. And the derivative of 5 to the 4, which is a constant, is 0. And so the final answer can be written as 1 divided by 2 root x. In this example, we need to find d to the x of root x times e to the x. d to the x is just another notation for the derivative of a function. So what we need to do here is to differentiate the product, square root of x times e to the x. According to the product rule, the derivative of this product will be equal to the derivative of the first factor, x to the 1 half, times e to the x, plus x to the 1 half times the derivative of the second factor, which is e to the x. The derivative of x to the 1 half can be computed using the Pau rule, and the derivative of e to the x is just equal to e to the x. So overall we get 1 half times x to the negative 1 half times e to the x, plus x to the 1 half times e to the x. This expression can be written as e to the x over 2 root x, plus e to the x times root x. And we can even factor e to the x from each term and get e to the x times 1 over 2 root x plus root x. In the fourth example, we need to find the derivative of f of x equals 2x divided by the cube root of x to the 7 plus 3. Note that the cube root of x to the 7 is the same as x to the power of 7 over 3. Using the quotient rule, we conclude that f prime of x will be equal to the derivative of the numerator, 2x, times the denominator, x to the 7 over 3 plus 3, minus the numerator, 2x, times the derivative of the denominator, x to the 7 over 3 plus 3. This we have to divide by the square of the denominator, which is x to the 7 over 3 plus 3 squared. The derivative of 2x is 2, and the derivative of x to the 7 over 3 can be computed using the Pau rule. When we do that, we get 2 times x to the 7 over 3 plus 3, minus 2x times 7 over 3 x to the 4 over 3, divided by x to the 7 over 3 plus 3 squared. Let's simplify the numerator, and get 2 times x to the 7 over 3, plus 2 times 3, which is 6, minus 14 over 3 times x to the 7 over 3. All of that is still divided by x to the 7 over 3 plus 3 squared. Note that the first and the third term in the numerator are both multiples of x to the 7 over 3, and so we can combine them to get negative 8 over 3 times the cube root of x to the 7 plus 6, divided by the same denominator, cube root of x to the 7 plus 3 squared. And that's the derivative of f. As you can see, finding derivatives using the differentiation rules is much faster and easier than using the limit definition. Before continuing to the next example, I would like to mention and emphasize a few things. First, as we've seen, we often need to use more than one rule to differentiate a function. There may be more than one way to find the derivative of a function, and there are several ways to denote derivatives, other than using the prime notation. Also remember, the derivatives can be used to find equations of tangent lines. And this is something we will do in one of our next examples. So let's summarize. Different symbols can be used to denote derivatives, such as d to the x, y prime, f prime of x, and then dy to the x at x equals a, and f prime of a. These both denote the derivative of a function at the point where x equals a. Also, we will see that sometimes there is more than one way to compute the derivative of a given function. And finally, the derivative can be used to find the equation of a tangent line to the graph of a function. And we will see that in one of our next examples. With these remarks in mind, 
Let's move on to example number 5. Differentiate y equals 6x to the 2 alpha plus 17 lambda x cubed e to the x, where alpha and lambda are constants. Alpha and lambda will be treated as fixed numbers, and so the derivative of the first term will be 6 times the derivative of x to the 2 alpha, which can be computed using the power rule. The derivative of the second term will be 17 lambda times the derivative of x cubed e to the x, which can be computed using the product rule. We get the following. y prime is equal to 12 alpha times x to the 2 alpha minus 1, plus 17 lambda times 3x squared e to the x, plus x cubed e to the x. We can simplify by factoring x squared and e to the x, and get 12 alpha x to the 2 alpha minus 1, plus 17 lambda x squared e to the x times 3 plus x. Now let's move on to our last example, example number 6. Let f of x equal 6x cubed plus x squared divided by 8x to the 9. a. Differentiate f in two ways. And b. Find the equation of the tangent line to the graph of f at x equals 1. Let's start with part a. Since f of x is a quotient of two polynomials, we can use the quotient rule to compute the derivative. When we do that, we get f prime of x is equal to the derivative of the numerator, 18x squared plus 2x, times the denominator, 8x to the 9, minus the numerator, 6x cubed plus x squared, times the derivative of the denominator, 72x to the 8. All of that is divided by the denominator squared, which is 64x to the power of 18. Using simple algebra, we can simplify and get negative 8x to the 10 times 36x plus 7 divided by 64 times x to the power of 18. After dividing top and bottom by 8x to the 10, we obtain negative 36x plus 7 divided by 8x to the 8. But there is another way. We can first simplify the function and write it as 1 over 8 times x to the negative 9 multiplying 6x cubed plus x squared, and expand to get 3 quarters x to the negative 6 plus 1 over 8 times x to the negative 7. Now we don't need a quotient rule to differentiate, and using mainly the power rule we get f prime of x is equal to negative 9 over 2 times x to the negative 7 minus 7 over 8 times x to the negative 8. Using simple algebra, we can easily see that we obtain the same expression, negative 36x plus 7 divided by 8x to the 8. Now let's move on to part b, where we need to find the equation of the tangent line to the graph of f at x equals 1. We start by computing f of 1, which is the y value of the point of tangency. f of 1 is equal to 6 times 1 plus 1, divided by 8 times 1, which is 7 over 8. Next we compute f prime of 1, which is the slope of our tangent line. Using the expression obtained in part a, we conclude that f prime of 1 is equal to negative 36 times 1 plus 7, divided by 8 times 1. This is equal to negative 43, divided by 8. Now we know that the tangent line, whose equation will have the form y equals mx plus b, has slope equals to negative 43 over 8, and that it passes through the point of tangency 1, 7 over 8. So b, which is equal to y minus mx, can be computed by plugging in the right values for x, y, and m, and it will be equal to 7 over 8 minus negative 43 over 8, which is equal to 25 divided by 4. So we conclude that y equals negative 43 over 8 x plus 25 over 4 is the equation of the tangent line to the graph of f at x equals 1. In this diagram we see the graph of the function f in blue, 
the point of tangency 1 comma 7 over 8 and the tangent line in green whose equation we found in this example. Computing derivatives is something that not only mathematicians do. Scientists, statisticians, and engineers are working with derivatives all the time. You should remember these rules as you will be using them throughout your calculus course and probably also in some of your future courses as well. You should spend some time practicing these rules and you can start by working on the problems provided at the end of this video. We hope to see you again in one of our next videos. Thank you for watching and good luck! The topic of today's lecture is the chain rule, which is a rule for differentiating the composition of two or more functions. Previously, we've learned rules for how to differentiate the sum, product, and quotient of two functions. While these rules are fundamental, they do not tell us how to differentiate a broad class of composite functions. Let's see how the chain rule remedies this situation. The chain rule states that if f and g are both differentiable functions, and if h of x is the composition of f and g, namely f of g of x, then h is a differentiable function, and the chain rule asserts that h prime of x is f prime evaluated at g of x times g prime of x. Rephrasing this, if h is the composition of f with g, f is the outer function, g is the inner function, and the derivative of h is the derivative of the outer function evaluated at the inner function times the derivative of the inner function. Here's the first example. Given the function h of x is 3 minus 7x to the fifth power, find h prime of x. Here's the solution. Recall the chain rule tells us that h prime of x is f prime of g of x times g prime of x. Here f is the outermost function and g is the innermost function. In our particular example, we see that the outermost function is x to the power of 5, and the innermost function is 3 minus 7x. Computing these derivatives, we see that h prime of x is 5 times the quantity 3 minus 7x to the fourth power times negative 7. 5 times the quantity 3 minus 7x to the fourth power represents the derivative of the outermost function, x to the fifth, evaluate the innermost function, 3 minus 7x, times negative 7, which represents the derivative of the innermost function, 3 minus 7x. Simplifying, we see the derivative of h at x is negative 35 times the quantity 3 minus 7x to the fourth power. Here's the second example. Given the function h of t is 4t divided by 3t cubed plus 2 all to the third power, find h prime of t. Here's the solution. Recall that the chain rule tells us that the derivative of h of t is the derivative of the outermost function evaluated at the inner function 
times the derivative of the inner function. In this case, the outermost function is t cubed, and the inner function is 4t divided by 3t cubed plus 2. To find the derivative of the innermost function, we'll need to use the quotient rule. Computing the derivatives, we see that h prime of t is 3 times the quantity 4t divided by 3t cubed plus 2, quantity squared, times 4 times 3t cubed plus 2, minus 4t times 9t squared, all divided by 3t cubed plus 2, quantity squared. Again, we use the quotient rule to compute the derivative of the innermost function. After simplification, we see that h prime of t is equal to 348t squared plus 576t to the fourth minus 1728t to the fifth, all divided by 3t cubed plus 2 to the fourth power. Here's the next example. Given that h of x is f of g of x, find h prime of 6 using the following table of information. Notice that the table gives us two values of x. Either x can be equal to 6 or x can be equal to 36. Then we can find the values of f, g, f prime, and g prime using the table. So, in order to find h prime of 6, we use the chain rule, which says that h prime of 6 is f prime of g of 6 times g prime of 6. According to the table, g of 6 is 36 and g prime of 6 is 12. Entering that information into the formula of the chain rule gives us that h prime of 6 is f prime of 36 times 12. The table also tells us that f prime of 36 is 24. So, putting it together, we see that h prime of 6 is 24 times 12, which is 288. As we have seen, the chain rule tells us that the derivative of a composition of two functions is the derivative of the outer function evaluated at the inner function times the derivative of the inner function. Identifying functions as a composition of two functions can be tricky. If you feel uneasy about this, take some time practicing with composition of functions. As we saw in our first example, the chain rule can be tremendously more effective than the previous differentiation rules. So, let's gather a few remarks before proceeding to further examples using the chain rule. First, we have the Leibniz notation. If y is equal to f of u, and u is equal to g of x, and in particular y is equal to f of g of x, then dy dx is equal to dy du times du dx. Here, dy du represents the derivative of the outermost function, and du dx represents the derivative of the innermost function. A useful trick to remember the chain rule is to think about the two differentials du canceling. However, since differentials can't simply cancel, that's only a trick for remembering how the chain rule works. Secondly, the chain rule can be used to find second derivatives. And recall that the notation for second derivatives is either f double prime of x or d squared y dx squared. Since the chain rule says the derivative of a composite function is the derivative of the outermost function times the innermost function, when computing the second derivative of a composite function, you will need to use the chain rule along with the product rule. Finally, the chain rule can be applied multiple times. So, if f capital of x is little f of g of h of x, then f capital prime of x is little f prime of g of h of x times g prime of h of x times h prime of x. So, we work from the outermost function to the innermost function, computing derivatives along the way.
Here's the next example. Find d squared y dx squared if y is equal to the square root of 19 minus 3x. Here, the outermost function is the square root of x, and the innermost function is 19 minus 3x. Here's the solution. d squared y dx squared is the derivative of dy dx. The chain rule tells us that dy dx is negative 3 divided by 2 times the square root of 19 minus 3x. Using the quotient rule, we see that this is 2 times the square root of 19 minus 3x times 0, which is the derivative of negative 3, minus negative 3 times the quantity 2 times negative 3 divided by 2 times the square root of 19 minus 3x, all divided by 2 times the square root of 19 minus 3x quantity squared. Simplifying, we see that d squared y dx squared is negative 9 divided by 4 times 19 minus 3x to the power 3 halves. Let's look at one last example. Given the composite trigonometric function f capital of x is the cosine of e to the power negative x squared plus x, find f capital prime of x. Notice here that the function f capital of x is a composition of three functions, cosine of x, e to the x, and negative x squared plus x. Here's the solution. Recall that the chain rule for the composition of three functions states that f capital prime of x is equal to little f prime of g of h of x times g prime of h of x times h prime of x. Since little f is cosine of x, little g is e to the x, and little h is negative x squared plus x, we can compute these derivatives to see that f capital prime of x is negative sine of e to the negative x squared plus x times e to the negative x squared plus x times negative 2x plus 1. Simplifying this expression, we see that f capital prime of x is equal to the quantity 2x minus 1 times e to the negative x squared plus x times the sine of e to the negative x squared plus x. So, if we see a function inside another function, we differentiate using the chain rule. We need to have a command of the previous differentiation rules as long as knowing common derivatives so that we can use the chain rule in conjunction with our other differentiation rules. Take some time to work the practice problems below so that you can get better command of using the chain rule. As you know, practice makes perfect. Thanks for listening, and good luck.
The topic of today's lecture is implicit and logarithmic differentiation. Up to this point, we've seen how to differentiate explicit functions. These are functions whose defining equations are solved for y. We will now learn how to differentiate implicit functions. These are functions whose defining equation is not solved for y. Throughout the rest of this lecture, we will use the chain rule time and time again. So if you need to, take some time and review the chain rule. Let's now see how we implicitly differentiate. To differentiate these relations implicitly, we assume that y is a function of x. Then we differentiate both sides of the equation with respect to x, making sure that we use the chain rule on occurrences of y. We'll also need to use all the previously learned differentiation rules when differentiating both sides of the equation. Finally, after you've differentiated both sides of the equation, bring y prime to one side of the equation and solve for y prime. Here's the first example. Differentiate the following relation implicitly with respect to x. 4x cubed minus 2xy squared plus y to the fifth plus sixth is equal to zero. Notice that the term negative 2xy squared and y to the fifth will require us to use the chain rule as they involve occurrences of y. Here's the solution. Differentiating the left-hand side with respect to x, using the product rule and the chain rule, we see that the derivative of the left-hand side is 4 times 3x squared minus 2y squared minus 2x times 2y times y prime where we use the chain rule, plus 5 times y to the fourth times y prime, again, where we use the chain rule, plus 0, is equal to the derivative of the right-hand side with respect to x, which is 0. Now, we'll solve for y prime. Bring the terms with y prime to one side of the equation, and throw the terms without y primes on the other. Doing this, we see negative 4xy times y prime plus 5y to the fourth times y prime is equal to negative 12x squared plus 2y squared. Factoring out the y prime, we see y prime times the quantity.
Hello, and welcome to the MCS video on related rates. Many physical and geometric quantities are related by explicit formulas. For example, the area of a circle is related to its radius. This means that if we change the radius of a circle at a given rate, then the area must change as well. Related rates problems are a type of problem encountered in calculus and its applications where the goal is to find the rate of change of a given quantity in terms of related quantities. We're often expected to find the equation that relates the various quantities and then use what we know about differentiation in order to solve for the unknown rate of change. In this video, we'll look at a few examples and discuss some guidelines to tackling related rates problems. Let's start with an example. To get started, let's look at the following example. A spherical ball is being inflated at a rate of 4 centimeters cubed per second. At what rate is the radius increasing when the ball has a radius of 21 centimeters? As we can see in the pictures, as the volume of air in the ball increases, the ball swells and its radius is getting larger. The question we're being asked is, if we know how fast the volume is increasing, how fast must the radius be increasing? To solve this problem, we take advantage of the relationship between the volume of the sphere and its radius. To begin, let's list the known and unknown quantities and label them on a diagram. Let's use V for volume, R for radius, and T for time. We know that dV dt is equal to 4 since the volume is increasing at a rate of 4 centimeters cubed per second. It's the word rate that tells us we're talking about a derivative. We need to find dr dt when r is equal to 21. In order to solve for dr dt, we need to find a relationship between the thing we know, the volume, and the thing we want to find, the radius. Recall that the volume of a sphere is given by v equals 4 thirds pi r cubed. In order to find dr dt, we need to differentiate both sides with respect to t. Using chain rule, and recalling that both volume and radius are changing with time, we get the following expression. dv dt is equal to 4 thirds pi times 3r squared dr dt. Simplifying, this gives the expression dv dt is equal to 4 pi r squared dr dt. We now substitute the things we know. We know that dv dt is equal to 4, and we're interested in what is happening when r is 21, so we substitute r equals 21. This gives 4 is equal to 4 pi times 21 squared dr dt. Solving for dr dt gives the following expression. dr dt is 1 over 441 pi. We conclude that the radius is increasing at a rate of 1 over 441 pi centimeters per second. We'll now discuss some guidelines for solving related rates problems. Keep in mind, these are only guidelines, and there can be more than one way to solve a given problem. To get started, identify the known and unknown quantities and, when appropriate, label them on a diagram. Next, clearly identify the question that's to be answered. Then, you should find the equation that relates the known and unknown rates of change. Do not sub in any known quantities yet. Then, differentiate both sides of the equation with respect to t. Insert the known quantities. And finally, solve for the unknown rate of change. Let's take a look at the following problem. Helena and Havin are running down perpendicular sidewalks towards the same intersection. Helena is running at a rate of 0.8 meters per second and is 12 meters from the intersection, while Havin is running at a rate of 1.2 meters per second and is 5 meters from the intersection. At what rate is the distance between them decreasing at this moment? As Havin and Helena run towards the intersection, they're getting closer and closer. We're given the speeds that they're running at, and we're asked to find out how the distance between them is changing as they approach the intersection. Keeping in mind our guidelines, let's label a diagram representing this problem. Let's let H be the distance between Helena and the intersection, J be the distance between Havin and the intersection, and s be the distance between Helena and Havin. We are given that dh dt is equal to minus 0.8 and dj dt is equal to minus 1.2. Note that the minus sign comes because the distances are decreasing. Again, it's the word rate that tells us that we're talking about derivatives. 
The problem we're asked is find ds dt when h is equal to 12 and j is equal to 5. To find the s that corresponds to h equals 12 and j equals 5, we use s squared is equal to h squared plus j squared. This comes because in the diagram we see a right triangle and we use Pythagoras' theorem. Subbing in h equals 12 and j equals 5, we can solve for s, and we see that s should be the square root of 169, or equivalently, 13. We now need to find the expression that relates the known and unknown quantities. In fact, we've already used the equation that relates them. We know that s squared is equal to h squared plus j squared. So we differentiate this with respect to t and get the equation 2s ds dt is equal to 2h dh dt plus 2j dj dt. We can now substitute in the known quantities. h is 12, j is 5, s is 13. And we sub in dh dt is minus 0.8, dj dt is minus 1.2. Solving for ds dt gives us minus 19.2 minus 12 over 26. Or, after simplifying, ds dt is minus 1.2. So we conclude that the distance between them is decreasing at a rate of 1.2 meters per second. Having seen some examples and discussed some general guidelines, perhaps now is a good time to pause and make some comments. First, the guidelines we've discussed are just that guidelines. The solutions that we've given are the solutions we've chosen to show, but you may come up with different solutions on your own. The same problem may have several acceptable correct solutions, so if you have something different, that's okay. Second, when we're at the step where we've set up the equation that relates the various quantities, it's often tempting to want to take the known, all the known information, sub it into the equation, and then work with the simplified equation. The problem with that is, when you've done this, you've removed all the variables and the time dependence. This means that when you move to the next step, which is differentiating, you'll be left with the equation 0 equals 0. That seems like an awful lot of work to find out something you already knew. Finally, in the questions that we've seen so far, we've been given all the rates of change that we need with the exception of the one we're solving for. In some problems, there are other quantities that show up and we're not given that information. Let's take a look at an example where we have to do some extra work to find all rates of change. A conical paper cup that is 8 centimeters across and 26 centimeters tall is filled with water. A hole at the bottom of the cup causes water to leak out at a rate of 4 centimeters cubed per second. How quickly is the water level dropping when the water is 11 centimeters deep? As the water drips out the bottom of the cup, the volume of water and the water level are both decreasing. We're told that the volume is changing at a constant given rate, and we're asked to find out the rate at which the water level is dropping at a given point in time. Keeping in mind our guidelines, let's get started by labeling a diagram. Let's use capital V for volume and T for time. Let's use capital R and capital H for the radius and height of the cup. Note that the cup is 8 centimeters across, so capital R is 4. And the cup is 26 centimeters tall, so capital H is 26. Let's use little r and little h for the radius and height of the water. Note capital R and capital H, these are fixed quantities, they don't change with time. But little r and little h are quantities that do change with time. We've been given that dv dt is minus 4. Again, the minus sign comes because the volume is decreasing. The question we've been asked is, find dh dt when h is equal to 11. Now notice at this stage, we see two unknown quantities, little r and little h. We're only asked about one of them. In order to eliminate the extra quantity, the little r, we'll have to take advantage of some geometry. To get started, notice that there's two similar triangles in the diagram. We're going to use these similar triangles to find a relationship between little r and little h. So notice to get started that little r over little h has to be the same as big R over big H. 
subbing in big R is 4, big H is 26, we can now solve for little r in terms of little h. This gives little r is 2 over 13 times little h. We now look for a relationship between the known and unknown quantities. To start, let's look at the equation for the volume of a cone. The volume of water at time t will be given by v equals pi over 3 little r squared times little h. Using the previous expression for little r, we can simplify this expression. We're left with the equation v is 4 pi over 507 times little h cubed. To find dh dt, we'll differentiate the expression v equals 4 pi over 507 little h cubed. Differentiating with respect to t gives dv dt is 12 pi over 507 times h squared dh dt. Subbing in the known quantities, dv dt equals minus 4 and little h equals 11, we get minus 4 is 12 pi over 507 times 11 squared dh dt. We now solve for dh dt. This gives dh dt is minus 169 over 121 pi. We conclude that the water level is dropping at a rate of 169 over 121 pi centimeters per second. In a yard, a prisoner is standing directly below a searchlight that is 30 meters above ground and shining on him. As he begins to run away from it at a speed of 2 meters per second, the light follows him. At what rate is the light rotating when the man is 40 meters away from the base of the pole? So as the prisoner runs away from the light post, the light tracks him. In order for the beam to track his movement, the light must rotate. We know the speed at which the prisoner is running, and we're being asked to find out how fast the light must be rotating at a given point in time in order to track the prisoner's movement. As we've done in previous problems, let's start by labeling a diagram. Let's let y be the distance between the pole and the prisoner. Let's let theta be the angle of the searchlight. And note that the pole is 30 meters tall. We've been given dy dt is equal to 2 since the man is running at a speed of 2 meters per second. The question we're being asked is, find d theta dt when y is equal to 40. We now need to find a relationship between the quantities involved. If we look closely at our picture, we see that we can use some trig to find this relationship. Specifically, we see that tangent of theta should equal y over 30. Rearranging, this tells us that y should equal 30 times tan theta. We can now differentiate this expression with respect to t. We get dy dt is equal to 30 secant squared theta d theta dt. We can now substitute in the known quantities and try to solve for d theta dt. After some rearranging and simplifying, we see that d theta dt should equal 2 times 30 over 50 times 50, or 3 over 125. So we finally conclude that the searchlight is rotating at a rate of 3 over 125 radians per second when the man is 40 meters from the pole. We have now seen some examples and discussed some general guidelines for solving related rates problems. However, there's a wide variety of related rates problems that we haven't discussed. In order to be comfortable and confident solving related rates problems, you're going to need to practice. In order to help, we've set up a few practice problems to get you started. Good luck and thanks for watching.
Hello and welcome to another video in the UTM Calculus video series. This time we're going to discuss L'Hopital's rule. This is a, a rule or a theorem for evaluating certain types of limits of quotients where both the numerator and the denominator approach zero or both of them approach plus or minus infinity. These are called indeterminate forms because they cannot be determined by simply inserting a value into the function. But L'Hopital's rule will help us evaluate some of these limits. Let's start by taking a look at what the rule actually says. Suppose that f and g are differentiable functions at x equals to a, and that the limit of f of x divided by g of x as x goes to a is an indeterminate form of the type 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. This means that either the limit of f of x is equal to 0 and the limit of g of x is equal to 0, or alternatively, the limit of f of x is plus or minus infinity and the limit of g of x is plus minus infinity. If either of these two cases occur, then the limit of f of x divided by g of x as x goes to a is equal to the limit of the derivative of f divided by the derivative of g as x goes to a, provided that the new limit is either finite or plus minus infinity. When solving questions using L'Hopital's rule, it's useful to proceed with the following three steps. First, check that the limit you're working with is an indeterminate form of the type 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. If it is, then you should differentiate f of x and g of x separately. That will give you a new limit, f prime of x divided by g prime of x. Try to evaluate this limit, and if the answer is finite or plus minus infinity, then this is also the answer to the original limit. Let's have a look at an example. Here we have the limit of ln x divided by x squared as x goes to infinity. Let's try to use L'Hopital's rule. That means that we need to find the limit of the numerator and the limit of the denominator as x goes to infinity. Looking at this graph, we see that the limit of ln x as x goes to infinity is infinity. This means that the limit of the numerator as x goes to infinity is infinity. Also, the limit of x squared as x goes to infinity is infinity. This means that we do have an in indeterminate form of the type infinity over infinity. So we are allowed to use L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule says we should differentiate the numerator and the denominator independently of each other. The derivative of ln x is 1 over x, and the derivative of x squared is 2x. This is the same as 1 over x multiplied by 1 over 2x, which simplifies to be 1 over 2x squared. Now the limit of this as x goes to infinity is equal to 0. This means that L'Hopital's rule has helped us find the answer to this limit. The limit of ln x divided by x squared as x goes to infinity is equal to 0. In the next example we have the limit as x goes to 0 of sine x over x. Again we should try to find out if this is an indeterminate form. The limit of sine x as x goes to 0 is 0 and also the limit of the denominator as x goes to 0 is equal to 0. Therefore we do have an indeterminate form of the type 0 over 0. Using L'Hopital's rule we should differentiate the numerator and the denominator independently of each other. The derivative of sine x is cos x and the derivative of x is 1. Inserting the value for x we see that the answer is 1. This means that the answer to the original limit is also equal to 1. Here we have the limit as x goes to 0 from the positive side of x squared plus 4x plus 7 divided by x. Let's check to see if this is an indeterminate form. If x approaches 0, the numerator will approach 7 and the denominator will approach 0. Therefore we do not have an indeterminate form and therefore L'Hopital's rule cannot be applied. We must find another method for evaluating this limit. For example, we can break up the quotient and make three smaller quotients. Simplifying each one, we see that the final answer is infinity. In the next example, we have the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the power of 5x divided by negative x plus 1 squared. First we have to find the limit of e to the power of 5x as x goes to infinity. Looking at the graph, we see that this limit is infinity. Also, the limit of the denominator is negative infinity. 
So this time we do have an indeterminate form and we are allowed to use L'Hopital's rule. The derivative of e to the power 5x is 5 times e to the power 5x and the derivative of the denominator is negative 2 times x plus 1. And although this is simpler than the original limit, it is still not completely trivial to see what this limit is. But if we evaluate the limit of the numerator and the denominator, we see that we again have an indeterminate form. Therefore, we can apply L'Hopital's rule for a second time. The derivative of the numerator is 25e to the power 5x, and the derivative of the denominator is negative 2. As x approaches infinity, the numerator will approach infinity, and the denominator will stay at negative 2, giving a final answer of negative infinity. So, now we've seen a number of examples of using L'Hopital's rule to evaluate limits of quotients of the form 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. Now, it is possible to also use L'Hopital's rule to evaluate other types of limits, provided that you can first rewrite them as a quotient of one of these forms. There are three main categories when this is possible. Here they are. L'Hopital's rule can also be applied to indeterminate products, indeterminate differences, and indeterminate powers. Very shortly we will see examples of each one of these. Just remember that L'Hopital's rule can only be applied to these provided that they can first be rewritten as an indeterminate quotient. Here we have the limit of a product. This is not a fraction, so L'Hopital's rule cannot be used as is, but we can rewrite this product as a fraction. Square root of x times ln x is the same as ln x divided by 1 over square root of x. Now we can check to see if L'Hopital's rule can be used. First we have to find the limit of ln x as x goes to 0 from the positive side. Looking at the graph of ln x, we see that this limit is equal to negative infinity. Also, the limit of 1 over square root of x as x goes to 0 from the positive side is infinity. Therefore, we do have an indeterminate quotient, and we can use L'Hopital's rule. The derivative of ln x is 1 over x, and the derivative of 1 over square root of x is equal to negative 1 divided by 2 times x to the power of 3 over 2. Simplifying this, we get 1 over x times 2 times x to the power of 3 over 2 divided by negative 1. And simplifying further, we get negative 2 times x to the power of a half. Now we can take the limit as x goes to 0 from the positive side, and the answer is 0. Here we have the limit of a difference. Let's start by trying to rewrite this as a quotient. We would get a common denominator of x times sine x, and the numerator would become sine x minus x. Now we have a quotient, and we can check to see if we can use L'Hopital's rule. The limit of the numerator is 0 as x goes to 0 from the positive side, and the limit of the denominator is also zero. That means that we are allowed to use L'Hopital's rule. The derivative of sine x minus x gives us cos x minus 1. And to differentiate the denominator, we need to use the product rule. The derivative of x times sine x is 1 times sine x plus x times cos x. Now we have the limit of a new quotient, but this is looking fairly complicated still. Maybe we can try to use L'Hopital's rule a second time. Now the numerator goes to 0, and also the denominator also goes to 0. Therefore, we still have an indeterminate form, and we are allowed to use L'Hopital's rule a second time. The derivative of cos x minus 1 is negative sine x, and the derivative of the denominator is cos x plus x times sine x plus cos x. Notice that we had to use the product rule to differentiate x times cos x. Now we can evaluate this limit by simply inserting 0 for x. Now we get 0 over 2, which is equal to 0. Notice that there are two ways to rewrite a product into a quotient. This is because you have a choice of which part of the function to use as your numerator and which one will be used to create the denominator. Personally, I like to choose whichever option is the easiest to work with, but if I get stuck, I might have to go back and try the other option. Apart from turning products into quotients, I also mentioned earlier that L'Hopital's rule can be used to uh, evaluate other indeterminate forms, for example, indeterminate powers. Now, this is a little more difficult, and it takes a little more work. 
but it means that we can evaluate much more complicated functions. Here are the steps that you would need to follow. To evaluate limits of indeterminate powers of the form 0 to the power of 0, infinity to the power of 0, or 1 to the power of infinity, you can use the following steps. Step 1. Apply the natural logarithm ln to the limit. Step 2. Using known properties of ln, rewrite the powers as products by bringing down the exponent and multiplying. Step 3. Once you have the limit of a product, you can use methods from previous examples to evaluate the limit. Step 4. So far we have calculated the ln of the limit. So if the limit in step 3 is L, the final answer to the original problem is e to the power of L. Here we have the limit of a power. Let's try to use L'Hopital's rule. First we need to take ln of the limit. Now we can move the ln inside of the limit because ln is a continuous function. Now, using properties of ln, we can bring down the exponent, 1 over x, and multiply. So we have 1 over x multiplied by ln 1 minus 2x. This is, can be written as a quotient, ln 1 minus 2x divided by x. And now we can check to see if we can use L'Hopital's rule. The limit of the numerator is ln of 1, which is equal to 0, and the limit of the denominator is equal to 0. Therefore, we can use L'Hopital's rule. The derivative of ln 1 minus 2x is 1 over 1 minus 2x multiplied by the inside derivative, which is negative 2. The derivative of x is 1. Now we can evaluate this limit by simply inserting 0 for x and simplifying. This gives us negative 2, but this is not the final answer. Remember that we calculated the ln of the original limit. Therefore, the final answer will be e to the power of negative 2. We have now seen many different types of limits where L'Hopital's rule can be used. Let's try to summarize some of them. The easiest ones are the quotients. Here you would take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator. Remember that you should differentiate each one independently of each other, not together using the quotient rule. We also saw examples of indeterminate products. These ones can be made into a quotient before using L'Hopital's rule. Slightly more complicated are limits of powers. You should start by taking the logarithm of the expression, which would allow you to rewrite this as a product. This product can then be turned into a quotient. There are also indeterminate differences. Some of these can be rewritten to become one of the above three types. To summarize, L'Hopital's rule is used for evaluating limits of indeterminate quotients, but you can also use it for other indeterminate forms, such as uh, differences, uh, products, even powers, as long as you turn them into a quotient. But remember to always check that your quotient is of the form 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity before attempting to use L'Hopital's rule. Well, you know what they say, practice makes perfect. So please go and have a look at some of our practice problems that we put together for you. And thank you for watching and good luck. Hello and welcome to a UTM calculus video on concavity and inflection points. So you might already know that um, first derivative of a function 
helps you find the minimum and maximum points and also intervals where the function is increasing and decreasing. But what does the second derivative tell you about the graph of a function? Well, that's the topic of this next video. Let's start by having a look at a few graphs. Suppose that we have a function which is twice differentiable on an interval i. Let's look at these two parts of the graph of a function and let's think about how the derivatives of the function might be able to help us tell the difference between these two types of behaviors. In the first picture, the first derivative of f is increasing. In other words, the slope of the tangent lines gets larger and larger as x moves from left to right. In this case, we say that f is concave up on this interval. In the second picture, the first derivative is decreasing. In other words, the slopes get smaller and smaller if f moves from left to right. Then f is called concave down on this interval. The easiest way to compute the difference between these two types of behaviors is to look at the second derivative. If the first derivative is increasing, that means that the second derivative is positive. So that would be the easiest way to compute that a function is concave up. Similarly, if the second derivative is negative, then the function will be concave down. If we compare these two pictures, we see that in both of them, the function itself is increasing. But in the first picture, it's concave up, and in the second picture, it is concave down. This means that the second derivative helps us tell the difference between the, these two types of curves. If f is a continuous function at c and f changes concavity, either changing from concave up to concave down, or from concave down to concave up, then we say that f has an inflection point at x equals to c. Again, the easiest way to check for this is to use the second derivative. If the second derivative changes sign at a point where f is continuous, then f has an inflection point at x equals to c. Here we have the graph of a function. Let's try to figure out where this is concave up and where is concave down. The function starts off being concave down on the first portion. This is because it starts off with a very large positive slope, but then the slope gets smaller and smaller. Uh, so therefore it's concave down up until roughly around a. At a, the slope is negative, uh, but it starts to get less and less negative. In other words, it's increasing. And it increases from a to b, so that means that the curve is concave up from a to b. At b, the slope starts to get smaller again, and it gets smaller and smaller, and then turns negative, and keeps getting smaller until around c, so that means that the curve is concave down from b to c. And from c onwards, uh, the curve is, is bending upwards, so therefore it's concave up. And so in summary, this curve is concave up from a to b and from c to infinity. It's concave down on negative infinity to a and from b to c. And there are three inflection points where the graph changes concavity. And these happen when x is equal to a, b, and c. So to summarize, we've seen that a function is concave up if the second derivative is positive, it's concave down if the second derivative is negative, and you have an inflection point at a point where the second derivative changes sign, and also the function has to be continuous. To figure out where a second derivative changes sign, we need to look for places where the second derivative is either zero or undefined. These are the only places where a function could possibly change from positive to negative or from negative to positive. So let's see how this would work in a few examples. We're going to do a number of examples where we're looking for intervals where a function is concave up or concave down, and also we want to find all the inflection points of the function. So the first step is to find the second derivative. So differentiating once using the power rule, we get x cubed over 3 minus x squared over 2 plus 2 differentiate a second time, we get x squared minus x. To find the inflection points, we need to find out where the second derivative changes sign. The only places where this might happen is where the second derivative is zero or undefined. So let's try to find those x values. So if the second derivative is zero, that means x squared minus x is zero. And if we factor this, we see that x is equal to zero or one. Where is the second derivative undefined? Well, x squared minus x is a polynomial, so this is never undefined. 
So x equals to 0 or 1 are the possible inflection points, but we still need to check whether the second derivative actually changes sign at any of those values. So let's take the number line and divide it up at 0 and 1, so we end up with three smaller intervals. Now let's check the sign of several different factors uh, at these different intervals. So we have x and x minus 1 because those are the factors of the second derivative. On the interval from negative infinity to 0, x is negative, and on the other two intervals, x is positive. x minus 1 is negative on the interval from minus infinity to 0 and on the interval from 0 to 1, but it's positive on the interval from 1 to infinity. Now, looking down each column, we can find the sign of the second derivative. So a negative number times a negative number is positive. Positive times negative becomes negative, and a positive multiplied by a positive number is a positive number. Now we can read from this interval that the second derivative is positive on the interval from minus infinity to 0 and from 1 to infinity. This means that the function is concave up on these intervals. Also, it's concave down on the interval from 0 to 1, because that's when the second derivative is negative. To see the inflection points, we need to find out where the second derivative changes sign. This happens when x equals to 0 and when x is equal to 1. So to find the y values of those inflection points, we calculate f of 0 is 1 and f of 1 is 35 over 12. So this gives us the two inflection points. Here we have a similar example, but this time f of x equals x to the power of 4 over 5. So again, the first step is to find the second derivative. Using the power rule, we bring down the 4 over 5 and multiply in front, and we subtract 1 from the exponent, so the new exponent becomes negative 1 over 5. Differentiating again, we get negative 4 over 25 times x to the power of negative 6 over 5. Another way of writing that is negative 4 divided by 25 times x to the power of 6 over 5. To find the possible inflection points, we need to find out where the second derivative is 0 or undefined. This is because those are the places where the second derivative might change sign. This time the second derivative is actually never equal to 0, because the numerator is never equal to 0. To find out where the second derivative is undefined, we need to set the denominator equal to 0. And this happens when x is equal to 0. So the only place where the second derivative might change sign is when x is equal to 0. So that means that we only have two intervals to check. We should check the sign of the different factors of the second derivative. Negative 4 is always negative. 25x to the power of 6 over 5 is always positive, because something to the power of 6 is always positive. So this means that the second derivative is negative on both of these intervals. Therefore, the function is concave down on both of these intervals. Because the second derivative never changes sign, there are no inflection points. Here's a graph to illustrate what we have just computed. Notice that there is no inflection point at x equals to 0, because the concavity does not change. In fact, the function is not even differentiable at that point. Let's do one more example of finding concavity and inflection points. As usual, the first step is to find the second derivative. Here's the first derivative which we got from using the quotient rule. If you want, you can pause the video and double check this. To find the second derivative, you would use the quotient rule again. And it might also be a good idea to factor as much as possible, because this will make it easier to find the places where the numerator or the denominator is equal to 0. To find the possible inflection points, we should find out where the second derivative is 0 or undefined. These are the places where the second derivative might change sign. To find where the second derivative is equal to 0, we should set the numerator equal to 0. x squared plus 12 is never equal to 0, so the only solution is when x is equal to 0. To find out where the second derivative is undefined, we should set the denominator equal to 0. Because we have factored as much as possible, it makes it easy to see that the solutions are x equals to negative 2 and x equals to plus 2. So the potential inflection points are where x equals to negative 2, 0, or 2. So these are the places where we should break up the number line. We should look at the factors of the second derivative and find the sign of each of those on these different intervals. 
4x times x squared plus 12 is negative if x is negative and positive if x is positive. x minus 2 is negative when x is less than 2 and positive if x is bigger than 2. x plus 2 is negative if x is less than negative 2 and positive otherwise. Now looking down each of these columns we can find the sign of the second derivative. For example looking at the first column three negative numbers multiply to give you a negative number. Now we can read from this column that f of x is concave up where the second derivative is positive in other words from minus 2 to 0 and 2 to infinity. It is concave down where the second derivative is negative in other words from minus infinity to negative 2 and from 0 to 2 to find the inflection points, we need to see where the second derivative changes sign. This seems to happen at all three places. However, if you plug in, for example, negative 2 into the function itself, we get division by 0. So negative 2 is not in the domain of the function itself. Therefore, this cannot be an inflection point. Similarly, for x equals to 2. Therefore, the only inflection point is at x equals to 0. We plug this into the function to get f of 0 equal to 0, so the only inflection point is 0, 0. Now to some general remarks. Remember that the x values where the first derivative is 0 or undefined are possible minimums and maximums. These should not be confused with inflection points and concavity that deal with the second derivative. Concavity is an independent concept from whether the function is increasing or decreasing. For example, a function could be concave up and at the same time either increasing or decreasing because these are separate concepts. Remember that if the second derivative is zero or undefined, this does not necessarily imply that f of x has an inflection point at c. The second derivative must also change sign at that point. Even if the second derivative does change sign at c, f of x must also be continuous at x equals to c. In particular, if f of c is undefined, then f of x can definitely not have an inflection point at x equals to c. And finally, to find the y value on inflection point, make sure to insert x equals to c in the function itself, not the derivative or the second derivative. So now we've seen several examples of how to compute where a function is concave up, concave down, and how to find the inflection points. We've also seen how concavity affects the graph of a function. Concavity is only one out of many features that you can use to help you sketch the graph of a function. But before you start practicing graph sketching, please have a look at our practice problems on concavity that we put together for you. Good luck. Hello and welcome to UTM calculus video on antiderivatives. In mathematics there are many important operations that also have a reverse operation. For example, we recently learned about differentiation. Its inverse operation is called anti-differentiation. In a derivative problem you would start with a function, say f of x, and you're trying to find its derivative, f prime of x, using the differentiation rules. In an antiderivative problem, you are given the derivative and you're trying to find out a corresponding function. For example, you might start with the velocity function of an object and you're trying to figure out a corresponding position function. In that case, you would need to take the antiderivative of the velocity function. So let's start by taking a closer look of the definition of an antiderivative. 
The definition of an antiderivative is as follows. A function capital F is called an antiderivative of a function small f on an interval i if the derivative of capital F is equal to small f of x for all x in that interval. As an example, let's have a look at the function f of x equals x squared and let's try to find the antiderivative of this function. If you knew capital F of x, you would need to differentiate to find small f of x. But now we are given small f of x, so we need to think of some function so that if you were to differentiate it, you would end up with x squared. For example, 1 over 3x cubed would work. This is because if you were to differentiate 1 over 3x cubed, you would end up with x squared. Therefore, this is an antiderivative. However, this is not the only antiderivative of x squared. For example, you could differentiate 1 over 3x cubed plus 1. The derivative of that is also x squared. Or, for example, 1 over 3x cubed plus 3. If you differentiate this, you also get x squared. Similarly, for example, 1 over 3x cubed minus 1.5. If you differentiate this, you also get x squared. This means that all of these are antiderivatives of x squared. This means that the general antiderivative of x squared is 1 over 3x cubed plus c, where c could be any constant. Let's think about what this means graphically. For example, consider the function 1 over 3x cubed plus 1, and the function 1 over 3x cubed plus 3, and the function 1 over 3x cubed minus 1.5. Looking at the graphs, we see that these are essentially the same graphs. They are just shifted up or down. This means that they have the same slope at the same points, so that they have the same derivative. For every differentiation rule that you've seen, there is a corresponding anti-differentiation rule. This means that you can check your work for an indefinite integral by differentiating to see if you get back to your original function. We'll see how in just a minute. But first, let's take a look at some basic rules for indefinite integrals. The set of all antiderivatives of a function is called the indefinite integral. The notation we use for this is the following. The indefinite integral of f of x dx is equal to capital F of x plus c. If and only if the derivative of capital F of x is equal to small f of x. The preceding example could be written as follows. The, the indefinite integral of x squared dx is equal to 1 over 3x cubed plus c. Let's have a look at a few properties of the indefinite integral. The first one is called the power rule. The indefinite integral of x to the power of n dx is equal to x to the power of n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus c, where c is any constant. Notice that n cannot be equal to negative 1 because that would give us division by 0. Therefore, we have a special rule when n is equal to negative 1. This indefinite integral is equal to ln of the absolute value of x plus a constant. Now let's have a look at an example. If you want to evaluate the integral of cube root of x, we would start by rewriting this as x to the power of a third. Now we can use the power rule. We would increase the exponent by 1, and then we would divide by the new exponent. This was simplified to be x to the power of 4 over 3, all divided by 4 over 3, plus a constant. Dividing by 4 over 3 is the same as multiplying by 3 quarters, and this was simplified to become 3 times the fourth root of x cubed, all divided by 4, plus a constant. Here's our next property. It's called the constant rule. If k is some constant and f is a function, then the indefinite integral of that constant times the function is equal to the constant times the indefinite integral of f of x. Now let's have a look at an example. If you want to evaluate the indefinite integral of 10 divided by square root of x dx, then we would start by taking out the constant 10 in front of the integral, and then we would use the power rule. Again, we would increase the exponent by 1 and divide by the new exponent. Then we would simplify this through several steps, and eventually we would get 20 times the square root of x plus c. Here are a few more properties of the indefinite integral. 
you should know that the integral of e to the power of x dx is equal to e to the power of x plus c. Also, if you have a constant, then the integral of that constant is k times x plus c. And if you have two functions, f and g, and you want to integrate either the sum or the difference of them, then you can integrate f of x and add or subtract the integral of g of x. Here is another example. If you want to evaluate the integral of 4x cubed plus 2x minus 1 dx, we would start by separating these into three separate integrals. In each of these you would take out a constant and then evaluate them using the power rule. As usual you would increase the exponent by 1 and divide by the new exponent. And for the last integral, the integral of a constant is equal to that constant times x. And of course always add plus c. Now we would simplify until we get our final answer. As a conclusion, our integral is equal to x to the power of 4 plus x squared minus x plus c. To check our work, we can take this and differentiate it using the differentiation rules. We would end up with 4x cubed plus 2x minus 1, which is exactly the function we started with. That means this is the correct answer. Here is another example where we have integral of 3e to the power of x plus 5 over x dx. First notice that this is not a power function because there is an x in the exponent. Therefore we cannot use the power rule. Here is the correct solution. We would first divide this up into two integrals and integrate each one separately. The integral of e to the power of x is equal to e to the power of x. And remember that the integral of 1 over x is equal to ln absolute value of x. And of course there is always plus c. Again we can check our work by differentiating this using the differentiation rules. We should get back to exactly the function that we started with. Notice that there are no simple rules for anti-differentiating a product or a quotient. That makes them much more difficult to integrate. But in some simple cases you can rewrite the expression and you can use some of the basic rules that we've just learned. Let's try that in a few examples. Here's an example of an integral of a product. Notice that we cannot integrate this by simply integrating each part and multiplying the answers. Instead we need to try something else. In this particular example we can expand the brackets to get x cubed plus 2x. Now we can easily integrate this by first dividing it up into two parts and using the power rule on each part. The final answer should be 1 over 4 x to the power of 4 plus x squared plus c. Here is another example, this time of a quotient. Remember that there is no simple rule for evaluating the integral of a quotient. But in this example, we can rewrite this quotient into two smaller quotients. Each of these smaller quotients can then be simplified by subtracting the exponents. Here, negative half minus 2 becomes negative 5 over 2. And 5 minus 2 becomes 3. Now I can integrate this by dividing it up to smaller integrals and then using the power rule. As usual, you would add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. Starting with negative 5 over 2, adding 1, that gives us negative 3 over 2. And for the second integral, 3 plus 1 gives us 4. And of course, always add plus c. Simplify this and the final answer ends up being negative 4 over 3 times the square root of x cubed minus 3 over 2 times x to the power of 4 plus c. So that's our video on antiderivatives and the indefinite integrals. I hope that you found it helpful. Please take a look at some of our practice problems and give them a try. Thank you for watching and good luck!
Hello and welcome to our video on the definite integral and Riemann sums. Previously, you have learned about the derivative of a function, how to compute it, and where it can be applied. The derivative is one of the basic notions in calculus. The definite integral is another basic notion in calculus that has important applications in mathematics, life and physical sciences, and other domains. One of the things you can do with integrals is finding the area of a region bounded by the graph of a function and the x-axis over a closed interval. In fact, the problem of finding areas and volumes of regions bounded by curved lines and surfaces motivated the development of the subject. So let's start by taking a closer look at the following area problem. If f is a positive and continuous function, how can we calculate the area of the region bounded by the graph of this function and the x-axis over a closed interval AB. One natural way to approach this problem is to try and approximate the region A using simpler shapes, whose areas we know how to compute, such as rectangles. If we use only two rectangles, then clearly the approximation is not going to be a very good one. But if we then increase the number of rectangles, and use more and more of them, and then add up their areas, then the number that we get will become closer and closer to the area of the actual region. Here is a more detailed description of this process. If f from ab to r is a function, we can divide the interval ab into n equal subintervals of width delta x given by b minus a over n and choose n points called sample points c1, c2 to cn one in each subinterval. Then the sum f of c1 times delta x plus f of c2 times delta x and so on up to f of cn times delta x is called the Riemann sum and it approximates the area of the region between the graph of f and the x-axis over the interval a b as long as f is positive. This long sum is nothing but the sum of the areas of the rectangles used to approximate the region. The width of each rectangle is delta x, and the height is determined by the value of the function on each of the sample points. The sample points can be anywhere in the interval. They can be left endpoints, right endpoints, midpoints, and so on. Here is a diagram that will help you understand the ingredients of a Riemann sum. Here we see the function, the interval, and we see how the interval was divided into n equal subintervals. In each subinterval, we chose a sample point, c1 in the first, c2 in the second, and so on. The width of each rectangle is the length of the subinterval, delta x, or b minus a over n. The height of every rectangle is determined by the value of f on each of the sample points. Now let's have a look at our first example. Approximate the area of the region S bounded by the curve f of x equals x squared and the x-axis over the interval 0, 1 using a Riemann sum with four subintervals of equal width and right endpoints as sample points. Here we need to divide the interval 0, 1 into four equal parts. And so we get four subintervals, 0 to a quarter, a quarter to one half, one half to three quarters, and three quarters to one. And so the width of each rectangle, which is the same as the length of the subintervals, is equal to a quarter. The right endpoints that we get in this partition are the following: quarter for the first subinterval, one half for the second subinterval, three quarters for the third subinterval, and one for the last subinterval. The Riemann sum, denoted here by S sub 4, will be equal to f of x1 times delta x plus f of x2 times delta x plus f of x3 times delta x plus f of x4 times delta x. Each term represents the area of one rectangle out of the four. So the first term will be equal to a quarter squared, or 1 over 16, times delta x, which is a quarter. The second term is one-half squared, which is a quarter, times delta x, which is also a quarter. 
the third term is 3 quarters squared or 9 over 16 times a quarter and the last term is 1 square times a quarter. This gives 30 over 64 or 0 0.47. In order to be able to find the precise area of such regions, we need to find a way of computing the limit of many Riemann sums. For this purpose, we make the following definition. Let f from a, b to r be a continuous function and sn a sequence of Riemann sums, one for each n, in which the widths of the subintervals are approaching zero as n goes to infinity. The definite integral of f on AB is the limit of all Riemann sums in that sequence as n goes to infinity. We also have a notation for that limit. We use an elongated S which is also called the integral sign or symbol. Then we write the function f of x and then the symbol dx. The endpoints of the interval a and b are placed below and above the integral sign. Now let's have a look at an example of how to compute a definite integral. Compute the area of the region S bounded by the curve f of x equals x plus 1 and the x-axis over the interval 1 to 2. In other words, we need to find the definite integral of x plus 1 over the interval 1 to 2. Here we are not going to compute a single Riemann sum, as Riemann sums only approximate areas. What we need to do is form a sequence of Riemann sums and then find their limit as n goes to infinity. So for each n we are going to divide the interval 1 to 2 into n equal pieces and then find the corresponding Riemann sum. The width of each rectangle will be 1, the length of the interval 1 to 2, divided by n. If we use right endpoints in this example, then the right endpoint of the first subinterval will be 1 plus 1 over n. The right endpoint of the second subinterval will be 1 plus 2 over n, and so on. The right endpoint of the last subinterval will be 2. The corresponding Riemann sum will be given by the usual formula f of x1 times delta x plus f of x2 times delta x, and so on. Recall that the function f of x is x plus 1. So when we compute f on the first right endpoint, we get 1 plus 1 over n plus 1, or 2 plus 1 over n. And then times delta x, which is 1 over n. The second term, f of x2 times delta x, will be equal to 2 plus 2 over n times 1 over n, and so on. The last term will be 2 plus n over n times delta x, which is 1 over n. When we expand, we will get two types of terms. 2 times 1 over n will be obtained n times, and when we collect these terms, we get 2 over n times n. The other type of terms will be 1 over n square, 2 over n square, 3 over n square, and so on, all the way up to n over n square. When we collect these terms and factor 1 over n square, we can write them as 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to n, all of that times 1 over n squared. And that's the expression for Sn. In the next step, we are going to use an algebraic formula for the sum of the first n positive integers. Using that formula, 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to n is equal to n times n plus 1 over 2. And so Sn becomes n n plus 1 over 2 times 1 over n square plus 2. We can simplify this expression and we end up with 2.5 plus 1 over 2n. This expression approximates the area of the region S when we use n rectangles. To find the precise area of S, we need of course to take the limit as n goes to infinity. So the area of S will be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 2.5 plus 1 over 2n. 
as 1 over 2n goes to 0 when n goes to infinity, the value of the limit is 2.5. In other words, the integral of x plus 1 from 1 to 2 is equal to 2.5. Note that in this example, the region S is a very simple region, and we can in fact split it into a rectangle and a triangle and add up the areas of these two simple shapes. Of course, when we do that, we end up with the same answer, 2.5. But this can be done only when the function is extremely simple. So in the first example, we saw how to calculate a single Riemann sum, a number that approximates the area of a region bounded by the graph of a given positive function and the x-axis. In the second example, we saw how to compute the actual area of such regions, or more precisely, the definite integral, by computing the limit of Riemann sums. As you can see, working with Riemann sums and computing their limits can be a long and somewhat complicated process. There is a better alternative, which is discussed in our video on the fundamental theorem of calculus. But right now, let's have a look at some of the basic properties of definite integrals. 1. If b is less than a, then the integral from a to b is equal to minus the integral from b to a. This is a useful convention that makes some of the other rules work in much more generality. 2. The integral from a to a of f of x dx is equal to 0, which makes sense, as we in fact integrate over a point. 3. The integral from a to b of a constant times a function is equal to that constant times the integral from a to b of the function. 4. The integral from a to b of a sum or a difference of two functions is equal to the sum or the difference of the two integrals. And finally, the integral from a to c of a function is equal to the sum of the integrals from a to b and from b to c of the same function. To understand this property, have a look at the diagram. The sum of the two integrals on the right-hand side represent two areas, and when you add up these two areas, you get the area of the region bounded by the graph of the function and the x-axis over the full interval that goes from a to c. Now let's move on to example number three. Suppose that f and g are integrable, meaning that they can be integrated, and that the integral from 0 to 2 of f of x dx is equal to 7, the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x dx is equal to 2, and the integral from 0 to 3 of g of x dx is equal to negative 1. Use the rules for definite integrals to find the following three definite integrals. So part A is quick. The integral from 3 to 3 of g of x dx is 0, as the upper bound and the lower bound are the same. In part b, the integral from 2 to 3 of f of x dx can be written as the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x dx minus the integral from 0 to 2 of f of x dx. Here we use one of the properties that we introduced before, and the fact that the integral from 0 to 3 can be written as a sum of the integral from 0 to 2 plus the integral from 2 to 3. Now the integral from 0 to 3 of the function f is known to be 2, and the integral from 0 to 2 is given to be 7. And so we end up with 2 minus 7, or negative 5. Finally, in part c, we need to find the integral from 3 to 0 of 2 times f of x dx. Again, using some of the properties, we know that we can switch the bounds of integration and write it as an integral from 0 to 3, but then we need to introduce a negative sign. And we can also pull out the constant 2 and put it in front of the integral. So we get negative 2 times the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x dx. This is equal to negative 2 times 2, 
or negative 4. Here is one last example in which we use geometry to compute a definite integral. Compute the integral from negative 1 to 2 of the function absolute value of x, dx. If we look at the diagram, we see that this integral represents the sum of the areas of two triangles. So when we add up the areas of the two triangles, we get 1 half, that's the area of R1, plus 2, which is the area of the triangle R2. The final answer is therefore 2.5. To summarize, a Riemann sum is a number that approximates the area of a region bounded by the graph of a given positive function and the x-axis. By taking the limit of Riemann sums, we can find the precise area of such regions. If the function is negative, the integral will be negative, but its absolute value will still represent area. If the function is simple enough, we might be able to use geometry and compute a definite integral without using Riemann sums. As I already mentioned, integrals are used in many places. They can be used to compute areas and volumes, to find the average value of a function, to solve differential equations, and more. They are used in other sciences and are closely related to derivatives. We end this video with a few exercises. Give them a try. That's your opportunity to review the topic and practice. So good luck with the exercises and thank you for watching. Hello and welcome to this important video on the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. Previously, you learned about two important concepts in calculus, the derivative and the definite integral of a function. The derivative of a function is the slope of the tangent line to its graph at a given point. The definite integral, however, was motivated by the problem of finding the area of a plane region. At first, it seems like these two concepts are completely unrelated. After all, why would there be a connection between slopes of tangents and areas? Surprisingly, there is a deep and important fundamental connection between these two notions. In some sense, integration is the reverse operation of differentiation. This idea is made precise in the fundamental theorem of calculus. Here's the first part of the theorem. If f is continuous on the closed interval a, b, then big F of x, given by the integral from a to x of little f of t dt, is differentiable, and big F prime of x is equal to little f of x for all x's in a, b. This means that big F is an antiderivative of the function little f. Informally, this statement means that when you start with a continuous function, integrate it, and then differentiate the integral, you get back your original function. Now let's have a look at a few examples. Differentiate the following two functions. In part a, the function big F is defined as the integral from 1 to x of cos t squared dt. In this case, 
we can apply the first part of the fundamental theorem right away, as the lower bound of the integral is a constant, 1, and the upper bound is the variable x. So by the first part of the theorem, we get that f prime of x is equal to cos of x squared. In the second part, in part b, we have another function, g of x, which is also defined as an integral. But this time, the lower bound is the variable, and the upper bound, pi, is a constant. So before we use the first part of the fundamental theorem, we will need to switch the order of the bounds. This would mean that we introduce a negative sign. And now g of x is written as minus integral from pi to x of e to the negative t squared dt, and we can apply the first part of the theorem. When we do that, we get g prime of x is equal to negative e to the negative x squared. Here's another example. Differentiate the function f of x defined as the integral from 1 to x squared of 1 over 2 plus cos t dt. Here we have a function defined again as an integral. The lower bound is a constant number, 1, and the upper bound is x squared. So we cannot apply directly the first part of the fundamental theorem. We can, however, do the following. Let g of x be given by the integral from 1 to x of 1 over 2 plus cos t dt, and let h of x be the function x squared. Note that g is almost the same as f. The only difference is that the upper bound was taken to be x instead of x squared. So it will be easy to apply the first part of the fundamental theorem. Also note that the composition g of h of x will be equal to the function f because when you take the function g and replace x by x squared, you get the integral that goes from 1 to x squared. Also remember that the chain rule says that the derivative of a composition will be equal to g prime of h of x times h prime of x. g prime of h of x is equal to g prime of x squared and now we can use the fundamental theorem to differentiate the function g. The derivative of g will be 1 over 2 plus cos x, and when evaluated at x squared, we get 1 over 2 plus cos of x squared. The derivative of h is very easy to compute, as x squared prime is known to be equal to 2x. And now all we need to do is multiply these two quantities, and we get that f prime of x is equal to 2x divided by 2 plus cos of x squared. Now let's have a look at our last example of this type. Differentiate the function f of x defined as the integral from x cubed to sine x 10 inverse of t squared dt. Here we have an integral in which both bounds are functions of x. And so before we differentiate f of x, we would like to write it as a sum of two integrals, each of which has a constant bound. So using the basic properties of definite integrals, we can write the function f of x as the integral from x cubed to 0 of 10 inverse t squared dt plus the integral from 0 to sine x 10 inverse of t squared dt. We would also like our lower bounds to be constants, and so in the first integral, we will switch the two bounds and get negative integral from 0 to x cubed 10 inverse of t squared dt plus the integral from 0 to sine x 10 inverse of t squared dt. Now we have two integrals, and in each one of them, the lower bound is a constant, 0, and the upper bound is a function of x. So we can apply the same method that we used in example 2 and differentiate these integrals. We will think of each of these integrals as a composition where the outer function is an integral that goes from 0 to x and the inner function is either x cubed or sine x. Then we will apply the chain rule to differentiate these compositions. We get the following. f prime of x will be equal to negative 
10 inverse of x to the 6 times x cubed prime, that's the derivative of the inner function, plus 10 inverse of sine square of x times, again, the derivative of the inner function, sine x prime. After computing these derivatives, we get negative 10 inverse of x to the 6 times 3x squared plus 10 inverse of sine squared x times cos x. So the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus allows us to differentiate functions defined as an integral. The second part of the theorem, also called the evaluation theorem, will be used to compute definite integrals. Recall that the definite integral of a function was defined as the limit of Riemann sums. But working with Riemann sums and finding their limits can be difficult and even impossible in most cases. The evaluation theorem will be used to quickly evaluate many definite integrals. The second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus says that if f is a continuous function on the closed interval a, b, and big F is any antiderivative of little f, then the integral from a to b of little f of x dx is equal to big F at b minus big F at a. In other words, to compute a definite integral, it is enough to find one antiderivative of little f of x, compute it at the endpoints a and b, and then take the difference. Here's a remark. The notation f of x with a vertical bar, a at the bottom and b at the top, stands for the difference big F of b minus big F of a, and will be often used when we work with the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now let's move on to some examples. Compute the following three definite integrals. In part a, we need to find the integral from 0 to pi of the function cos x. An antiderivative of cos x is sine x, and so by the fundamental theorem, we need to evaluate sine x at pi and 0 and compute the difference. The final answer ends up being 0. In part b, we need to find the integral of 1 over x on the interval that goes from 1 to 2. An antiderivative for 1 over x is ln absolute value of x. And so by the fundamental theorem, we evaluate ln absolute value of x at the two endpoints and then compute the difference. We get ln 2 minus ln 1, and as ln 1 is equal to 0, the final answer is ln 2. And finally, in part c, we need to find the integral of square root of x plus x over x, from 4 to 9. In this case, it would be better to first simplify the function and write this integral as the integral of 1 over square root of x plus 1, from 4 to 9, and then find an antiderivative. An antiderivative of 1 over square root of x is 2 times root x, and an antiderivative for 1 is x. We evaluate this expression at 4 and 9 and then take the difference. We get 2 times 3 plus 9 minus 2 times 2 plus 4. We get 15 minus 8 which is equal to 7 and that's the final answer for part C. The last example in this video is of an applied nature. The velocity of a particle moving along a line is given by the function v of t equals t squared plus t plus 1. Find the displacement d of the particle over the time interval 0 to 5. First, let's recall that if r of t denotes the position of the particle at time t, then the derivative r prime of t will be the velocity of the particle at that time and the displacement over a time interval a, b is the difference r of b minus r of a. In our case, we need to find the displacement over the time interval 0 to 5. So d will be equal to r of 5 
minus r of 0. This difference can be also written using the vertical bar notation. According to the fundamental theorem, this will be equal to the integral from 0 to 5 of the velocity function, v of t, as r of t, the position, is an antiderivative of the velocity function. So we get integral from 0 to 5, t squared plus t plus 1 dt, an antiderivative would be t cubed over 3 plus t squared over 2 plus t, with bounds 0 and 5, and when we plug in the bounds and compute the difference, we get 5 cubed over 3 plus 5 squared over 2 plus 5 minus 0, which is equal to 355 over 6, or 59.2. To summarize, the fundamental theorem of calculus reveals a surprising and important link between derivatives, which measure the rate of change of a given function, and definite integrals, which measure areas. The first part of the theorem is used to differentiate functions defined using integrals, and the second part can be used to compute definite integrals quickly and efficiently. In the last example, we even saw how the fundamental theorem can be used in a more applied setting, to analyze the motion of a particle along a straight line. We conclude this video with a few exercises. Please use them to review this topic and practice the material. Thank you for watching, and good luck. Hello. In this video, we will discuss a useful technique of integration called the substitution method. This technique can be used to find antiderivatives of various functions. Because of the fundamental theorem of calculus, we often need to find antiderivatives when calculating a definite integral. The substitution method is obtained from the chain rule, a rule used to differentiate a composition of two functions. However, the substitution method is not as straightforward as the chain rule, and it might be tricky to use. Let's start by presenting the substitution formula. If f is continuous and g is differentiable, then the integral of f of g of x times g prime of x dx equals the integral of f of u du, where u equals g of x. This means that when we need to integrate a product of two functions, f of g of x, namely a composition of two functions, and g prime of x, the derivative of the inner function, then we can use this formula and basically integrate the function f only with respect to the variable u, which equals g of x. Let's look at a simple example. Evaluate the integral of 2x times e to the x squared dx. Here, we need to integrate a product of two functions e to the x squared is the composition of the exponential function and the function x squared, while 2x is exactly the derivative of the inner function x squared. So we can do the following. We let u equal g of x equal x squared, and then the derivative g prime of x is equal to 2x. We take the outer function f of u to be e to the u, and then the given integral can be written after changing the order of the two factors as the integral of e to the x squared times 2x dx. 
Using the substitution formula, this would be equal to the integral of e to the u du, which is equal to e to the u. Now u is equal to x squared, so e to the u is equal to e to the x squared, and then plus c, as this is an indefinite integral. Now let's have a look at another example. Compute the integral of x times the square root of 2x squared plus 1 dx. Again, we need to integrate a product of two functions, and the second factor is a composition of the square root function and the function 2x squared plus 1. So we can start as follows. We can let u be equal to g of x equals 2x squared plus 1, and then the derivative g prime of x would be equal to 4x. Now here we have a little problem, as x is not quite the derivative of the inner function, and the coefficient 4 is missing. Nevertheless, we can easily deal with this problem. Let's take the outer function, f of u, be equal to the square root of u, and then we can rewrite the given integral as 1 over 4 times the integral of the square root of 2x squared plus 1 times 4x. We didn't change anything as we multiply and divide it by 4, but now the 4x is exactly the derivative of the inner function g of x, and we can apply the substitution formula. When we do that, we get a quarter times the integral of u to the one-half du. This can be easily evaluated using the Pau rule for anti-differentiation, and we get a quarter times two-thirds times u to the three-halves. After simplifying and replacing u by 2x squared plus 1, the inner function, we obtain 1 over 6 times the square root of 2x squared plus 1 cubed plus c. As you can already see, it is not always obvious how to choose the right substitution. And in practice, you might need to try a few substitutions and find the one that works. In certain cases, we might need more than one substitution, and we will see that in one of our next examples. Also, remember to express the final answer for an indefinite integral in terms of the original variable, x in our examples, and not in terms of the variable u. A few comments before we move on to our next example. First, the substitution method can be used to compute definite integrals, which might represent areas, volumes, average values, and so on. Here's a substitution formula for definite integrals, which is very similar to the one we used so far. The substitution formula for definite integrals is integral from a to b, f of g of x times g prime of x dx, is equal to the integral from g of a to g of b, f of u du. Note that in a definite integral, when we make a substitution, we have to replace the bounds a and b with new bounds, g of a and g of b. Let me also emphasize that in an indefinite integral, the answer should be given in terms of the original variable, x in our example. And here's one more remark about an informal notation that is often used when making a substitution. If u represents a function g of x, then the derivative g prime of x can be written as du over dx. This is the Leibniz notation. Now we can informally multiply both sides by dx and write du equals g prime of x dx. This notation is often used when making a substitution and we replace g of x by the variable u and g prime of x dx with the quantity du. Let's see how this is done in the next example. Find the integral of 10 sine to the 9x cos x dx. Here we need to integrate a function that contains a power of the sine function multiplied by the cosine function. And since cos x is the derivative of sine x, it makes sense to try the substitution u equals sine x. So let u equal sine x, and then du would be equal to the derivative cos x dx. In the given integral, we replace sine x by u, 
and cos x dx by du. We get the integral of 10 u to the 9 du. This integral is equal to u to the 10, and when we go back to x, we obtain sine to the 10x plus c. In this example, we need to find the definite integral from 0 to 4 of the function x divided by the fourth root of 2x plus 3 dx. Here, it is not clear at all which substitution is going to work. But the denominator is a composition of two functions, and the inner function is 2x plus 3. So we are going to take that as our u. So if u is equal to 2x plus 3, or in other words, x is equal to u minus 3 divided by 2, then du would be equal to the derivative 2 times dx. Or we can write it as dx equals to du over 2. Performing the substitution, we get the following. 1 half times the integral from 3 to 11, u minus 3 over 2, divided by u to 1 over 4, du. How did we get that integral? Well, dx was replaced by du over 2. The 2x plus 3 in the denominator was replaced by u. And x in the numerator was replaced by u minus 3 divided by 2. Also note that the bounds have changed. When x is equal to 0, u would be equal to 3. And when x is equal to 4, u is equal to 8 plus 3, which is 11. So the new bounds for the variable u are 3 and 11. We now simplify the quotient to get 1 over 4 integral from 3 to 11 u to the 3 quarters minus 3 u to the negative a quarter du. And we now integrate to get 1 quarter times 4 over 7 u to the 7 over 4 minus 3 times 4 over 3 times u to the 3 quarters from 3 to 11. We now sub in the bounds and compute the difference and we get 11 to the 3 quarters times 11 over 7 minus 1 minus 3 to the 3 quarters times 3 over 7 minus 1. We can simplify that and get 4 over 7 times the fourth root of 11 cubed plus the fourth root of 3 cubed or just use a calculator and get approximately the number 4.754. Note that this number is the area of the region bounded between the graph of the function and the x-axis from 0 to 4. Now let's move on to our last example. Evaluate the indefinite integral of 2 times ln e to the x plus 1 over e to the x plus 1 times e to the x dx. Here the expression e to the x plus 1 appears twice and its derivative is precisely e to the x. So we start by making the substitution u equals e to the x plus 1. If u is equal to e to the x plus 1, then du is equal to the derivative e to the x dx. When we make the substitution, we get integral 2 ln u over u du. Again, e to the x plus 1 was replaced by u, and e to the x dx was replaced by du. Now we need another substitution, as the derivative of ln u is 1 over u. So let t equal ln u, and then dt would be equal to 1 over u du. When we make that second substitution, we get the integral of 2t dt. This is equal to t square. When we go back to u, we get ln u squared. And when we go back to x and replace u by e to the x plus 1, we get ln of e to the x plus 1 squared plus c. To summarize, 
the substitution method is used to compute integrals that cannot be computed using more elementary techniques. It is not always easy to choose the right substitution, and we might need to use more than one substitution. The DUDX notation is often used in substitutions, and the method works for both definite and indefinite integrals. As always, watching this video or reading about substitutions in your textbook is not enough. You must practice and work on problems on your own. And for that reason, we included a few practice problems you can start with. Thank you for watching, and good luck. Hello, and welcome to our video on calculating areas. In this video, we will see how to use definite integrals to calculate areas of various regions in the plane. In high school, you must have seen formulas for finding areas of simple shapes, like a triangle or a trapezoid. But using integrals, we will be able to calculate areas of much more complicated regions. We will focus on the problem of finding the area of a region bounded by a graph of a function and the x-axis, and on finding the area of a region bounded by two different curves. But let's start with a quick review. Recall that the definite integral of a function f from a closed interval a, b to r measures the signed area of the region between the graph of f and the x-axis over the interval AB. This means that regions above the x-axis are considered to be positive, and regions below the x-axis are considered negative. Also recall that if f and g are two continuous functions, and f is greater or equal than g on the interval that goes from A to B, then the region R between the graph of f and g has area equal to the integral f of x minus g of x dx from a to b. Now let's look at the following example. Find the area of the region bounded by the graph of f of x equals 2x plus 1 and the x-axis from x equals 4 to x equals 7. The graph of f is a straight line. Here's the graph and the region bounded between the graph and the x-axis from x equals 4 to x equals 7. Note that f is a positive function on that interval, and so the integral is expected to be positive and be equal to the area of the gray region. So the area is going to be equal to the integral of 2x plus 1 dx from 4 to 7. Using basic anti-differentiation rules, we get x squared plus x from 4 to 7 and after subbing in the values and computing the difference, we get 49 plus 7 minus 16 plus 4, which is equal to 36. And so the area of the gray region is 36. But there is another way. In this specific case, the region is a simple shape. It's a trapezoid. Let's mark its vertices by A, B, C, and D. Now, we can use the formula for the area of a trapezoid to calculate the area. The area of a trapezoid is equal to the sum of the bases, AD and BC, divided by 2, times the height of the trapezoid, 
CD in our example. Using the formula for the function f, we can compute AD and BC, and we get 15 plus 9. We divide by 2 and multiply by the height, CD, which is equal to 3. We end up, of course, with the same answer, 36. Now let's move on to another example. Compute the area of the region bounded by the graph of f of x equals 1 minus x squared and the x-axis from x equals 0 to x equals 2. Here, the function f is positive from 0 to 1 and negative from 1 to 2. And so we will have to split the region into two different parts and find the area of each part separately. So f is positive from 0 to 1 and therefore the area of region 1 is given by the integral of 1 minus x squared dx from 0 to 1. We integrate and get x minus x cubed over 3 from 0 to 1. We sub in the bounds and compute the difference and end up with 2 thirds. That's the area of region 1. Now f is negative from 1 to 2 and so if we just integrate the function on that interval, we will obtain a negative number. But the area has to be positive, and it will be equal to the absolute value of the integral from 1 to 2. So the area of region 2 is given by the absolute value of the integral 1 minus x squared dx from 1 to 2. We integrate and get the absolute value of x minus x cubed over 3 from 1 to 2. We sub in the bounds and again take the difference and get absolute value of negative 4 thirds. That is equal to 4 thirds. Our conclusion is that the total area of the gray region will be equal to the sum of the area of region 1 and the area of region 2. We get 2 thirds plus 4 thirds and that is equal to 2. So the total area is equal to 2. Now let's move on to example number 3. Calculate the area of the region bounded by the two graphs, f of x, which is equal to x squared plus 2, and g of x, which is equal to the square root of x, from x equals 0 to x equals 2. Here we need to find the area of a region bounded between two graphs, and from the diagram we can see that f is always greater than g. And so the area between the two curves will be given as the integral of f of x minus g of x dx as x goes from 0 to 2. We sub in the functions and get the integral from 0 to 2 of x squared plus 2 minus x to the 1 half dx. Note that the function g square root of x was written here as x to the 1 half power. Now we integrate, and we get x cubed over 3 plus 2x minus 2 thirds times x to the 3 over 2, and the bounds are 0 and 2. Now we need to sub in the bounds and compute the difference. If x is equal to 2, we get 8 over 3 plus 4 minus 2 thirds times the square root of 8. When x is equal to 0, then the whole expression will be 0. After simplifying, we get 20 minus 2 root 8 over 3, and that is the area of the shaded region. A few comments before we continue. In all the questions we have seen so far, the bounds of integration were given in the question. This might not always be the case. In some questions, you might need to identify the bounds of integration while setting up the integral. Moreover, in some of the more advanced exercises, you might need to use a combination of strategies to compute the required area. And finally, in some cases, we might need to integrate with respect to the variable y and not x. So let's summarize these three important remarks and then move on to some more examples. 
In some problems, the boundaries of an enclosed region are not given. You may need to draw a diagram or find points of intersection to identify the bounds. Sometimes, a combination of strategies is required to compute the area of an enclosed region. In some cases, it might be easier to integrate with respect to the y variable instead of x. What does that mean? Given two curves, if both of them can be expressed as a function of the variable y, say x equals f of y and x equals g of y, and if g of y is greater or equal than f of y for all y's between c and d, then the area between the curves is given by the integral from c to d of g of y minus f of y dy. Now let's move on to our next example. For f of x equals negative 3 quarters x plus 11 quarters and g of x equals 4 over x minus 2, find the area of the shaded region in the following diagram. If you look carefully at the diagram, you will see that parts of the region are between f and g and other parts are between f and the x-axis. Also, part of the region is above the x-axis and the other part is below the x-axis. So we decide to split the region into three different parts and we will calculate the area of each part separately. To do that, we need to find the x-coordinate of the points a, b, c and d. G and F have x-intercepts of 2 and 11 over 3, respectively. These can be found by setting F and G to 0 and solve for x. We need to find the points of intersection for F and G. These are the points A and D. This can be done by setting F equals G and solve for x. When we do that, we get the equation negative 3 over 4x plus 11 over 4 equals 4 over x minus 2. We rearrange and get the following quadratic equation. Negative 3x squared plus 19x minus 16 equals 0. This equation can be solved using the quadratic formula and we get two solutions, x equals 1 and x equals 16 over 3. And these are the x coordinates of the points a and d. Now we can go ahead and calculate the areas. Region 1 is bounded between f and g, and so its area is given as the integral from 1 to 2 of f of x minus g of x dx. We sub in the functions and integrate, and we get negative 3 over 8 x squared minus 4 ln x plus 19 over 4 x from 1 to 2. Once we sub in the bounds and compute the difference and simplify, we end up with the number 29 over 8 minus 4 ln 2. Region 2 is bounded between the graph of f, which is positive on that interval, and the x-axis. And so the area of that region will be equal to the integral from 2 to 11 over 3 of f of x dx. We plug in the function and get the integral from 2 to 11 over 3, negative 3 quarters x plus 11 over 4 dx. We integrate to get negative 3 over 8 x squared plus 11 over 4 x from 2 to 11 over 3. And once we sub in the bounds and compute the difference, we end up with the number 25 over 24. And that's the area of region number 2. Finally, region 3 is bounded by the graph of f and the x-axis again, but now f is negative, and so the area will be equal to the absolute value of the integral of f of x dx, as x goes from 11 over 3 to 16 over 3. We plug in the function and integrate to get negative 3 over 8 x squared plus 11 over 4 x from 11 over 3 to 16 over 3, all in absolute value, and then plug in the numbers and compute the difference to get negative 25 over 24 in absolute value. This is equal 
to 25 over 24, and that's the area of region number 3. The total area will be, of course, equal to the sum of all the three areas that we computed. When we plug in all the values and simplify, we end up with negative 4 times ln 2 plus 137 divided by 24. Or we can use a calculator and conclude that the total area is approximately equal to 2.936. Now here's our last example. Compute the area of the region bounded by the two graphs, x equals y squared minus 2y, and x equals negative y squared plus 2y plus 6. The graphs of these two equations are parabolas, and we need to find the area of the region bounded between the two parabolas. As the equations are given in the form x equals to something in terms of y, it would be easier to use integration with respect to the y variable. But first, we need to find the points of intersection for both graphs. To do that, we write the equation y squared minus 2y equals negative y squared plus 2y plus 6 and simplify. We get a quadratic equation 2y squared minus 4y minus 6 equals 0, and we can use a quadratic formula to solve this equation and obtain the solutions negative 1 and 3. These are going to be the bounds of integration. Now, as the x values on the red parabola are greater than the x values on the blue parabola for y's between negative 1 and 3, we need to subtract the blue parabola from the red parabola and then integrate. So the area of the region is given by the integral from negative 1 to 3 of negative y squared plus 2y plus 6 minus y squared minus 2y dy. We simplify and integrate and get negative 2 thirds y cubed plus 2y squared plus 6y and the bounds are negative 1 and 3. We plug in the bounds and compute the difference we get negative 18 plus 18 plus 18 minus 2 thirds plus 2 minus 6. The final answer is 64 over 3, and that's the area of the shaded region. As you can see, the main challenge in calculating areas is setting up the correct integral. This will depend on whether the region is bounded by one graph and the x-axis, or by two different curves. We may need to split the region into several parts and calculate the area of each part separately. Sometimes, integrating with respect to y is easier or more natural. You will need to practice in order to become better in choosing a suitable strategy and in setting up the correct integral. And you can start by working on the problems provided at the end of this video. Thank you for watching and good luck. Hello and welcome. In this video we are going to discuss integration by parts. This is a method for integrating somewhat difficult integrals. It's usually used to integrate a product of two different types of functions. So you might have, for example, a logarithmic function multiplied by a power function, or you might have an exponential function multiplied by a trigonometric function. 
So usually products of two different types of functions. Although integration by parts can also be used for other types of integrals. We are going to see several examples, but first let's have a look at the method itself and also some of the background of where it comes from. The method of integration by parts is based on the product rule for differentiation. Solving or rearranging for f of x times g prime of x gives f of x times g prime of x is equal to the difference of the other two. Integrating both sides of this equation, we get the following. Notice that the integral of the derivative of f of x times g of x is just f of x times g of x. This means that if you have the integral of f of x times g prime of x, then this is equal to f of x times g of x subtract the integral of f prime of x times g of x. And this is called the integration by parts formula. We can rewrite this formula by making the following substitutions. If you let u equals to f of x, so that informally du would be f prime of x dx, and also we let dv be g prime of x dx, so that v is equal to g of x, then the formula becomes the integral of u dv is equal to u times v minus the integral of v du. This is another way of writing the integration by parts formula. Notice that we would start with an integral of u dv, and this transforms the problem into integrating v du. We are hoping that this new integral is easier than the original integral, and we will see this in many of the examples to follow. To integrate by parts, you should strategically choose u and v, and then apply this formula. Here are a number of remarks. Integration by parts is often used to integrate a product of two functions. However, it can also be used for other types of integrals. When you choose u and v, you should try to choose u so that it's easy to differentiate, and you should try to ensure that dv is easy to integrate. You are also hoping that the new integral, the integral of v du, is easier to compute than the original integral, the integral of u dv. If the integral on the right-hand side ends up being harder than the original integral, then maybe you should go back and try a different u and dv. Sometimes you might need to try several different combinations of u and dv before finding the right one. Let's have a look at an example. Here we have the integral of x multiplied by e to the power of x, so we have a product. First we need to choose our u and dv. Here we'd like to choose u equals to x and dv equals to e to the power of dx. This means that u is going to be easy to differentiate, the derivative of x is just 1, and e to the power of x would be easy to either integrate or differentiate, so v is equal to e to the power of x. Using the integration by parts formula, we end up with the original integral equals to x times e to the power of x subtract the integral of e to the power of x times dx. The integral of e to the power of x dx is just e to the power of x plus c, of course. Notice that the new integral, the integral of e to the power of x dx, is easier than the original integral in the question. Here is our second example. First we need to choose our u and our dv. This time we are going to choose u is equal to ln x, because ln x would have been very difficult to integrate, so we would rather choose this as our u, which means we have to differentiate it, and that we can do. The derivative of ln x is 1 over x dx. The remaining part of the integrand is x squared dx, so therefore this is our dv. Integrating this, we end up with v equals to one-third x cube. Now using the integration by parts formula, we get the integral of x squared ln x dx is equal to one-third x cube ln x, subtract the integral of one-third x cube times one over x dx. We can simplify this integral to be just the integral of one-third x squared dx, which is very easy to evaluate. The final answer is 1 third x cubed ln x subtract 1 over 9 x cubed. And don't forget to add plus c at the end. Here we have the integral of x squared e to the power of x dx. First we have to choose our u and dv. This time we will let u equals to x squared, because differentiating this will make it easier. 
whereas integrating x squared would have made it more complicated. On the other hand, e to the power of x will be the same regardless if you integrate or differentiate. Once we've made our choice, we just compute the derivative of u to give us du equals 2x dx, and the integral of dv gives us v is equal to e to the power of x. Now we insert all these things into the integration by parts formula, and we end up having to integrate e to the power of x 2x dx. This integral is still not trivial. On the other hand, it is simpler than the original integral in the question, so I think we are going in the right direction. Let's try to use integration by parts again to evaluate this new integral. We have to choose a new u and a new dv. This time u will be 2x and dv is e to the power of x dx, which means du is 2 times dx and v is equal to e to the power of x. Again, inserting the integration by parts formula, we are replacing the integral of e to the power of x 2x dx with 2x e to the power of x subtract the integral of 2 e to the power of x dx. Multiplying out these brackets, we end up having to evaluate the integral of 2 e to the power of x dx, which is just 2 e to the power of x plus a constant. Here we have the integral of e to the power of x times cos x dx. In other words, an exponential function multiplied by a trigonometric function. In this case, both of the functions are easy to integrate and easy to differentiate, so it doesn't matter how we choose our u and our dv. For example, we can choose u equals e to the power of x and dv equals to cos x dx, which means that du is e to the power of x dx, and the integral of cos x is sin x, so v is equal to sin x. Now we insert this into the integration by parts formula we end up with the integral of e to the power of x times sine x dx. This is not really any simpler than the original integral. On the other hand, it's not more difficult either, so let's try using integration by parts again, and let's see what happens. Let's choose u to be the same again, u is equal to e to the power of x, and dv this time is sine x dx. This means du is e to the power of x dx, and v is the integral of sin x, which is negative cos x. Now we replace the integral e to the power of x sine x dx by the integration by parts formula, negative e to the power of x cos x plus the integral of e to the power of x cos x dx. Simplifying these brackets we get e to the power of x sine x plus e to the power of x cos x subtract the integral of e to the power of x cos x dx. Let's summarize what we've found so far. We have found that the integral of e to the power of x cos x dx is equal to e to the power of x sine x plus e to the power of x cos x minus the integral of e to the power of x cos x dx. That means that the new integral that we have is exactly the same as the original integral in the question. This means that we can add this integral to both sides of this equation, meaning that we have two times the original integral equal to e to the power of x sine x plus e to the power of x cos x. So to find a final answer, all we need to do is to divide both sides by 2. So the integral e to the power of x cos x dx is equal to a half e to the power of x sine x plus a half times e to the power of x cos x, and always plus a constant since we are dealing with an indefinite integral. To summarize, to find this answer we had to integrate by parts twice to get back to the same original integral as in the question, and then add that to both sides. Now we have seen a number of examples of using integration by parts, and as you can see some of them can be fairly complicated and quite long. Uh, this means that if possible you should try to use another simpler method. For example, if you see a substitution that might work, you should probably try that first before trying a longer method, such as integration by parts. In all the examples we've seen so far, we have seen indefinite integrals. But integration by parts can also be used for definite integrals. So let's have a look at how that might be done. Here is the integration by parts formula stated in terms of a definite integral from A to B. 
If you have an integral from a to b of f of x times g prime of x dx, that means that the new integral will also be evaluated from a to b. It also means that you have to evaluate f of x times g of x on the interval from a to b. We can rewrite this formula in terms of the u and dv notation, and the formula becomes as follows. Notice that you have to integrate each part from a to b, and also evaluate u times v on the interval from a to b. Here is an example of a definite integral where we can use integration by parts. As usual, the first thing we should do is to choose our u and dv. This time we will let u equals to ln of 2x, because ln 2x would be very difficult to integrate, so we would rather have it as our u. This means that dv is the remaining part, which is x to the power of 4 dx. Once we've made our choice, we can compute du is equal to 1 over 2x times the inside derivative, which is 2, dx. This simplifies to become 1 over x dx. Integrating x to the power of 4, we get v equals x to the power of 5 over 5. Now let's insert this into the integration by parts formula. So we end up with ln 2x times x to the power of 5 over 5, evaluated from a half to 1. Subtract the integral from a half to 1 of x to the power of 5 over 5, multiplied by 1 over x dx. Simplifying this, we can take 1 over 5 out in front of the square bracket, since it's just a constant. So we have x to the power of 5 ln 2x evaluated at a half to 1. Subtract the integral, we can also take 1 over 5 out in front, because it's a constant. And we end up with the integral from a half to 1 of x to the power of 4 dx. And this integral is just x to the power of 5 over 5. So now all we need to do is evaluate these things at a half and 1. When evaluating the first one here, we have to first insert a 1. So we get 1 times ln 2. And then subtract and insert a half. So we get a half to the power of 5 times ln 1. In the second part, we have to first insert 1, so we get 1 to the power of 5, subtract, inserting a half, so we get a half to the power of 5. Simplifying this, we see that ln of 1 is equal to 0, so all we're left with is 1 over 5 ln 2, subtract 1 over 25 times 1 minus 1 over 32, which simplifies as 1 over 5 ln 2 times 1 over 25 times 31 over 32. In other words, 1 over 5 ln 2 subtract 31 over 800, which is the final answer. Notice that the final answer to this last example was a number, not involving the variable x in this case. If your final answer to a definite integral involves x, then you, that means you made a mistake. Most likely you forgot to evaluate one of the parts that needed to be evaluated at a and b. So now we've seen a number of examples of using integration by parts on both definite integrals and indefinite integrals. And I hope that you found the video useful. But as usual, the only way to really understand a mathematical method or technique is to practice it many times yourself. And for this reason we put together some practice problems for you to try. So good luck with the practice problems and thank you for watching.
Hello and welcome to this video on improper integrals on bounded intervals. In one of our previous videos, we discussed definite integrals and Riemann sums. As you probably remember, the definite integral was introduced for functions defined on a closed interval, AB, namely, an interval that includes its endpoints. These functions also had to be bounded, and in most examples we focused on continuous functions. In this video we are going to generalize the notion of the definite integral to unbounded functions, whose domain is not a closed interval. Let's start by looking at some diagrams. In the first diagram we see a region bounded by a graph of a function f and the x-axis over the interval AB. However, the function f is undefined at B and has a vertical asymptote there. The second diagram is similar. This time, the function f is undefined at the left endpoint A and again has a vertical asymptote. In the third diagram, the function f is defined at the endpoints, but it is undefined at some point in the interior of the closed interval AB and has a vertical asymptote there. In all these cases, we will not be able to find the area of the region by simply writing a usual definite integral as the function f is not defined on the full closed interval, AB. And so the problem is, how can we compute areas of regions, such as in these diagrams? The following definitions will help us resolve this problem. 1. If f is continuous on the interval AB, closed at A, open at B, then we define the integral from A to B, f of x dx, to be the limit as c goes to b from the left, integral from a to c, f of x dx. 2. If f is continuous on the half open, half closed interval a, b, this time open at a, closed at b, we define the integral from a to b, f of x dx, to be the limit as c goes to a from the right, integral from c to b, f of x dx. And finally, if f is continuous on the union of the two half-open, half-closed intervals, a to c and c to b, then we define the integral from a to b, f of x dx, to be equal to the integral from a to c, f of x dx, plus the integral from c to b, f of x dx. Note that in the first and the second definition, the improper integral from a to b was defined as the limit of usual definite integrals as c approached one of the endpoints of the interval, either a or b. In the third definition, the function f is undefined at a point c in the interior of the interval, and so the integral from a to b is defined to be the sum of the two improper integrals from a to c and from c to b, according to the first two definitions. Now let's check a few examples. Compute the following integrals. Integral from 0 to 1, 1 over 2 root x dx. Integral from 0 to pi over 2, sin x over root cos x dx. And integral from 0 to 1, ln x dx. In part A, we have an improper integral, as the function 1 over 2 root x is undefined at the lower bound, x equals 0. And so, according to our definitions, what we need to do is replace the lower bound by a variable c, compute the integral from c to 1 of the function 1 over 2 root x dx, and then let c approach 0 from the right and find the limit. An antiderivative of 1 over 2 root x is square root of x, and so this is equal to the limit as c goes to 0 from the right, square root of x, on the bounds c and 1. We substitute the bounds and compute the difference and we get limit as c goes to 0 from the right, square root of 1 minus square root of c. And as c goes to 0, square root of c goes to 0 as well, and so the limit ends up being 1. In part b, we have another improper integral. Cos of pi over 2 is 0, and so the function sine x over square root of cos x is undefined at the upper bound, pi over 2. So this time we need to replace the upper bound with a variable, c, 
and compute the limit as c goes to pi over 2 from the left, integral from 0 to c, sine x over square root of cos x dx. We use a substitution, u equals cos x, and so we get limit as c goes to pi over 2 from the left, integral from 1 to cos c, negative 1 over square root of u du. An antiderivative would be negative 2 root u, and so we get limit as c goes to pi over 2 from the left, negative 2 root u, and the bounds are 1 and cos of c. We plug in the bounds and compute the difference. We get limit as c goes to pi over 2 from the left, negative 2 square root of cos c plus 2, as the square root of 1 is 1. When we take the limit, cos of c will approach 0 as c goes to pi over 2, and so we end up with 0 plus 2, which is equal to 2. In part c, we need to find the integral from 0 to 1 of the natural log function. This time, our function is undefined at the lower bound, 0, and so we need to take the limit as c approaches 0 from the right, integral from c to 1, ln x dx. To compute the definite integral, we use integration by parts. We take our u to be ln x, and dv would be dx. We get limit as c goes to 0 from the right, x ln x on the bounds c and 1, minus the integral from c to 1, x times 1 over x dx. The first term gives us ln of 1 minus c times ln c. The second term is the integral of the constant function 1. An antiderivative would be x, and when we plug in the bounds, we get 1 minus c. And so we end up with negative the limit, c goes to 0 plus c times ln c minus 1. The limit is equal to 0. This can be done using L'Hopital's rule, and so we end up with 0 minus 1, which is equal to negative 1, and that's the final answer. Now let's have a look at another example. Consider the region S bounded between the graphs of y equals 10x and y equals secant of x for x's between 0 and pi over 2. A. Write an integral that calculates the area of the region and explain why it is an improper integral. B. Evaluate the integral you found in part A. Now, it is not difficult to see that secant of x is greater or equal than 10 of x for all x's between 0 and pi over 2. And so the area of the region S is given by the integral from 0 to pi over 2 secant of x minus 10 of x dx. This is an improper integral as the functions secant of x and 10x are undefined at the upper bound pi over 2. In part b, we need to evaluate the integral from 0 to pi over 2 secant of x minus 10x dx, which was obtained from part a. As this is an improper integral, and the function is undefined at the upper bound, pi over 2, the integral will be equal to the limit as c approaches pi over 2 from the left, integral from 0 to c, secant of x minus 10x dx. To evaluate the definite integral from 0 to c, we use previous results or a formula sheet. An antiderivative for secant of x is ln absolute value secant of x plus 10x, and an antiderivative for 10x is minus ln of absolute value of cos x. When we plug in the bounds, 0 and c, we get ln absolute value of secant of c plus 10c plus ln absolute value of cos c minus ln of 1 plus 0 in absolute value minus ln of 1. This simplifies to ln absolute value of secant of c plus 10c times cos of c by properties of logarithms. Also remember that ln of 1 is 0, so the last two terms are 0. The product inside the logarithm simplifies to 1 plus sine of c 
And so now we need to find the limit of that expression as c approaches pi over 2 from the left. As the limit of sine c as c goes to pi over 2 is 1, the final answer ends up being ln of 1 plus 1, which is equal to ln 2. So we've seen a few examples of how to compute these improper integrals. In each example, we had to first compute a definite integral and then evaluate the limit of the result as c approached a number. This means that if that limit is not finite, for instance, if it's plus or minus infinity, then the improper integral will not end up being a number. In these cases, we say that the improper integral diverges. However, if the answer does end up being a number, then we say that the improper integral converges. Also remember that these improper integrals look pretty much like a usual definite integral. The only way to identify them is to examine the function closely and check if it's unbounded or undefined at some value between the lower bound and the upper bound. Let's summarize these comments and look at a few more examples. Improper integrals can be equal to positive infinity, negative infinity, or not exist. In these cases, we say that the improper integral diverges. If the improper integral is equal to a number, we say that the improper integral converges. And finally, an important reminder. It is your task to identify integrals as improper. These type of integrals look like a usual definite integral and you have to check carefully the function and find out if we have a definite integral or an improper integral. Now let's move on to our next example. Show that the following integrals diverge. Integral from 2 to 3, 1 over 2 minus x dx, and the integral from 0 to pi, secant square of x dx. The first integral is improper because the function 1 over 2 minus x is undefined at the lower bound, 2. And so to compute it, we take the limit as c approaches 2 from the right, integral from c to 3, 1 over 2 minus x dx. An antiderivative for 1 over 2 minus x is negative ln absolute value of 2 minus x. We plug in the bounds, c and 3, and then we need to take the limit. We get limit, c goes to 2 from the right, of negative ln 1 plus ln absolute value of 2 minus c. Ln of 1 is 0, and so we have the limit as c approaches 2 from the right, ln of absolute value 2 minus c. Now, as c approaches 2, the absolute value of 2 minus c will be a small positive number, will approach 0. And so the logarithm of a variable that goes to zero will give us a limit of negative infinity. Therefore, the given integral diverges. In part b, we need to find the integral from zero to pi of secant square of x dx. Recall that secant of x is one over cos of x. And so the function secant square of x is defined at the endpoints, zero and pi. However, cos of pi over 2 is 0, and so the function secant square of x is undefined at x equals pi over 2. As this function is undefined at some point in the interior of the interval 0 to pi, what we need to do here is split the integral as a sum of two integrals, from 0 to pi over 2 and from pi over 2 to pi. Both of these are improper integrals. Let's compute the first one. The integral from 0 to pi over 2 secant square of x dx is an improper integral as the function is undefined at the upper bound, pi over 2, and so we need to take the limit as c goes to pi over 2 from the left, integral from 0 to c secant square of x dx. An antiderivative for secant square of x is of course 10 of x, and so we have the limit as c goes to pi over 2 from the left, 10 of x, and the bounds are 0 and c. We plug in the bounds and we get the limit of 10c as c goes to pi over 2 from the left 
and that limit is equal to infinity as the function 10x has a vertical asymptote at x equals pi over 2. Similarly, we compute the other integral from pi over 2 to pi secant square of x dx. This time we need to take the limit as c approaches pi over 2 from the right, integral from c to pi secant square of x dx. The antiderivative is again 10 of x, and when we plug in the bounds, we end up with the limit as c approaches pi over 2 from the right, negative 10c, and this is equal to infinity, as the limit of 10c, when c goes to pi over 2 from the right, will be equal to negative infinity. So therefore, the integral from 0 to pi of secant square of x dx is equal to infinity, as it is a sum of two improper integrals, and both of them are equal to infinity. Therefore, the integral diverges. So to summarize, in this video we extended the notion of the definite integral, and saw how to integrate functions which are unbounded, and whose domain is not a closed interval. This is called improper integration and it is normally done by first computing a definite integral and then evaluating a limit. Improper integrals can be equal to a number, in which case we say that they converge, or may be infinite or not exist, and then we say that they diverge. Improper integrals are important objects in mathematics, with many applications in other sciences, like statistics, physics, and more. So thank you for watching, and don't forget to try our practice problems. Good luck! Hello and welcome to this video on trigonometric substitution. Before you watch this, you should make sure that you're familiar with integration, but also the regular substitution method. To find the integral of a function, you will need to find an antiderivative of that function. But this is not always easy to do. Trigonometric substitution is a type of substitution which will help us evaluate certain types of integrals. And it usually works best with those functions that involve a square root of a quadratic function. Let's have a look at how this is going to work. Trigonometric substitution is a type of substitution that involves a change of variable from x to theta. And we would usually use it when you have an integrand or function that you're trying to integrate which involves one of these three types of square roots. If it involves the square root of a squared minus x squared, you would normally substitute x is equal to a times sine theta. If it involves the square root of a squared plus x squared, you would substitute x equals to a tan theta. And if it, your expression involves square root of x squared minus a squared, you would substitute x equals to a secant theta. We will make each of these substitutions on these corresponding intervals that are listed here. And the reason for this is that we would like our change of variable to be invertible, so that later on we can change back to the variable x. However, the interval corresponding to secant theta could be slightly different, depending on which textbook you're using. Uh, regardless, the identities that are listed here are the identities that will be used to simplify these expressions and so we can use these trigonometric identities to eliminate the square roots, usually. 
Here is our first example. We would like to integrate the square root of x squared minus 4 divided by x dx. And to do this we should uh, note that the square root of x squared minus 4 is square root of x squared minus 2 squared. So in this case a is equal to 2 and therefore we should use the substitution x equals to 2 times secant theta. We're using secant theta because we have x squared minus a number in the square root. This means that dx will be 2 times secant theta times tan theta d theta. That's just the derivative of secant theta where theta is in one of these intervals. And as I mentioned earlier, these intervals might change depending on which textbook you're using. But regardless, we can simplify the square root of x squared minus 4 in the same way. We would replace x by 2 times secant theta. Then this would simplify, and we can factor out a 4, which means we have the square root of 4 times tan squared theta. This is because secant squared theta minus 1 is equal to tan squared theta. Now we get 2 times the absolute value on tan theta. But notice that on these specific intervals, tan theta is positive. So therefore we don't need to include the absolute values. So we've simplified square root of x squared minus 4 to become 2 tan theta. So let's see, summarize what we have so far. So we made a substitution x equals to 2 secant theta, which means that dx is equal to 2 secant theta tan theta d theta. We also found that simplifying square root of x squared minus 4, we get 2 times tan theta. Now let's insert all of this into the original integral. So square root of x squared minus 4 becomes 2 tan theta. x in the denominator becomes 2 times secant theta. And instead of dx, we have 2 secant theta tan theta d theta. Now we can simplify this by cancelling 2 times secant theta, and we're left with 2 tan squared theta d theta. We would take out the 2, the constant, out front of the integral and we use the trigonometric identity to simplify tan squared theta to become secant squared theta minus 1 because each of these is going to be easier to integrate than tan squared theta. We can now change this into two integrals and we can integrate each one. The integral of secant squared theta is tan theta and the integral of 2 times d theta is just 2 theta. And, of course, we have plus a constant. So now we have that the integral is equal to 2 times tan theta minus 2 theta plus c. Now, all that's left to do is to change back to x. Remember that the substitution we made was x equals to 2 times secant theta. We can draw a triangle where this is true. So, in other words, secant theta has to be x over 2. Or another way of saying that is that cosine theta is 2 over x. Using Pythagorean theorem, we can calculate the third side, which is the square root of x squared minus 4. Now, reading from this triangle, we can see that theta is equal to secant inverse of x over 2, and also tan theta, which is opposite over adjacent, gives us square root of x squared minus 4 divided by 2. Now, insert this information into the answer that we had, and we get tan theta is replaced by square root of x squared minus 4, over 2, and theta is replaced by secant inverse of x over 2. Simplifying this, we get square root of x squared minus 4 minus 2 secant inverse x over 2 plus a constant. And this is the final answer. Here's our next example. This time we have a definite integral from 1.5 to 3 of dx over x squared square root of 9 minus x squared. So again, we have an integrand that involves the square root of a quadratic function. Notice that square root of 9 minus x squared is equal to 3 squared minus x squared. So in this case, a is equal to 3. And because we have a number minus x squared, this means we should use sine theta. So let x equal to 3 times sine theta. Differentiating this, we see that dx is equal to 3 cosine theta d theta. And the interval we're working in with is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Now let's simplify that square root. So instead of x, we have 3 times sine theta. Multiply out those brackets and then factor a 9. We see that 1 minus sine squared theta is the same as cos squared theta. Taking the square root of a square becomes absolute value. So we have the absolute value of 3 uh, cos theta. But on this particular interval, cosine theta is positive. So that means that we don't need those absolute values. 
So let's summarize what we have so far. We made a substitution x equals to 3 sine theta, which means dx is 3 cosine theta d theta, and the square root of 9 minus x squared, we just saw that that simplifies to become 3 cos theta. Also, we need to change these limits of integration to correspond to the new variable theta. So if x is equal to 1.5, this means that 1.5 is equal to 3 sine theta. So sine theta is equal to a half, and on the interval from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, this means that theta has to be pi over 6. Similarly, if x is equal to 3, that means 3 is equal to 3 sine theta, so sine theta is equal to 1. On the interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, this means that theta has to be pi over 2. So now we have found all the details of this substitution that we are trying to make, and we also found the new limits of integration. So let's insert all of this into the original integral. The new limits of integration are pi over 6 and pi over 2, dx has become 3 cosine theta d theta, and x has been replaced by 3 sine theta, and also we saw that the square root of 9 minus x squared is equal to 3 cosine theta. Now all of this simplifies to become just d theta over 9 sine squared theta. And another way of writing this is we can take out the 1 over 9 because it's a constant, and 1 over sine squared theta is equal to cosecant squared theta. That's just the definition of cosecant theta. The integral of cosecant squared theta is equal to negative cotangent theta. So now all that's left is to insert those values and evaluate cotangent of pi over 2, subtract cotangent of pi over 6. Cotangent of pi over 2 is equal to 0, and cotangent of pi over 6 is equal to square root of 3. That's because tangent of pi over 6 is equal to 1 over root 3. Now simplifying this, we get the final answer of square root of 3 over 9. Let's do one more example. So in this case we have the square root of 4x squared plus 9. We can think of this as 2x all squared plus 3 squared. This means that 2x, which is the part in the, in the bracket, should be replaced by 3 times tan theta. And we have tan theta because we have something involving x squared plus a number. Another way of writing this is that x is equal to 3 over 2 tan theta. And this means that dx is 3 over 2 secant squared theta d theta. Where the interval corresponding to this tan theta substitution is minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. So to simplify the square root, we have to replace x by 3 over 2 tan theta. We can simplify this, becomes 9 tan squared theta plus 9, and if you factor out a 9, we get tan squared theta plus 1, which we know is equal to secant squared theta. So we get 3 times the absolute value of secant theta. But on the interval from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, secant theta is positive. So this is equal to just 3 times secant theta. So now we are ready to do the actual substitution. We want to insert all these details into the original integral. So dx is the same as 3 over 2 secant squared theta d theta, x is equal to 3 over 2 tan theta, and we saw earlier that the square root it simplifies to become 3 secant theta. We can simplify this by cancelling one of the copies of secant theta. Also, we can take all the constants and put them at front of the integral. To see what else we can cancel, let's try to rewrite each of these as expressions involving only sine and cosine theta. So secant theta is 1 over cosine theta, and tan squared theta in the denominator becomes cosine squared theta over sine squared theta. Now we can see that some of these parts cancel, and we get just cotangent theta times cosecant theta. And the constants out front simplify to be 2 over 9. The integral of cotangent theta times cosecant theta is negative cosecant theta. So now we have that the integral is equal to negative 2 over 9 cosecant theta plus c. And the final step is to substitute back to x. So remember that the substitution we made was 2x equal to 3 tan theta. We can draw a triangle where this is true. So in other words, tan theta is 2x divided by 3 we can let the opposite side be 2x and the adjacent side 3. Then we can use the Pythagorean theorem to find the hypotenuse, which will be the square root of 4x squared plus 9. Then cosecant theta is the same as 1 over sine theta, which is the same as hypotenuse over opposite.
So looking at the triangle, we can see that this is the square root of 4x squared plus 9 over 2x. We can insert this into our answer to the integral and simplify to get the negative of square root 4x squared plus 9 over 9x plus a constant. And this is the final answer to this integral. So now we've seen examples of all three types of trigonometric substitution and we've also seen examples of definite integrals as well as indefinite integrals. But it's also important to know when to use trigonometric substitution in the first place. I think the next slide will hopefully help you get an idea of, of when to use it. Here we have a number of examples of integrals and all of these can be solved using trigonometric substitution. Notice that all of them involve a square root of a quadratic function, even that those that maybe don't look like it at first. So for example 25 plus x squared to the power of half, that is of course a square root. Also 4 minus x squared to the power of 3 over 2, that is also a square root that has been disguised slightly. Notice that the square root can also be uh, raised to a certain power. For example, here we have square root of 2x squared minus 9 to the power of 5. Uh, this can still be solved using trigonometric substitution. Also, some of these involve a coefficient in front of the x squared, and we saw an example of how to deal with that. In the example where we have square root of x squared minus 4x plus 7, you would start by first completing the square of this and then using trigonometric substitution. So when should you use which type of trigonometric substitution? Well, in the first column we have a number minus x squared, which means we should use sine theta. In the middle column we have a number plus x squared, or similarly x squared plus a number, it would be the same thing. All of these we would use tan theta. And in the third column we have x squared minus a number. And here it would work best to use secant theta. Here are a few remarks of things to keep in mind. Always check for an easier strategy before proceeding with trigonometric substitution because sometimes some integrals can be solved using regular substitution and that might be faster. Remember that you always need to express your final answer of an indefinite integral using the variable given in the question. So if the question is stated in terms of x, this means that you need to substitute back to x in your final answer. Drawing triangles is usually the easiest way to substitute back to the original variable. So remember that when you're studying integration, it's important to know how to use each of the different methods really well. But it's also important to know when to use which technique. Trigonometric substitution is a fairly long and complicated method, so it might be better to consider simpler methods, such as regular substitution first, and only use trigonometric substitution if you really have to. Please have a look at our practice problems, and remember that most of them will most likely require trigonometric substitution, but some of them might be possible to solve using simpler methods. Good luck. Hello, and welcome to the MCS video on partial fractions. You may have seen how to integrate simple functions using some techniques like substitutions and integration by parts. However, you might not know how to integrate some very simple functions, namely rational functions, using these techniques. The method of partial fractions is one that allows us to integrate rational functions. 
The idea here is that we treat a rational function as the result of adding some simpler rational functions by finding a common denominator. The technique of integrating by partial fractions is the process of undoing this common denominator to get a bunch of simple pieces and then integrating those simple pieces. In this video, we'll go through some examples and discuss some general guidelines for integrating rational functions using the partial fraction method. Let's start with an introductory example. To get started, let's look at the following example. Suppose we're asked to integrate the rational function 4 over x squared minus 6x plus 5. Before we get started, let's make the following observation. Suppose we're asked to subtract two rational functions, like 1 over x minus 5 minus 1 over x minus 1. The first step is to find a common denominator. In this example, we get x minus 1 over x minus 5 times x minus 1 minus x minus 5 over x minus 1 times x minus 5. We can simplify and we get 4 over x squared minus 6x plus 5. That was the original rational function we were interested in. So notice that we can write the rational function 4 over x squared minus 6x plus 5 as the difference of two simpler rational functions. This means that when we want to integrate 4 over x squared minus 6x plus 5, we can write it as a difference of two simpler integrals. We can write it as the integral of 1 over x minus 5 minus the integral of 1 over x minus 1. Each of these is simpler to integrate, and they give us log x minus 5 absolute value minus log x minus 1 in absolute value plus a constant. Having seen this introductory example, we might ask whether the technique used was simply a coincidence or whether there's something more general in play. We'll now discuss some general guidelines that will allow us to integrate more complicated rational functions. We'll start by discussing the case where the degree in the top is smaller than the degree in the bottom. To get started, if we're given a rational function f of x equals p of x divided by q of x, exactly one of the following cases must hold. The first case is when the degree of p is smaller than the degree of q. The second case is when the degree of p is greater than or equal to the degree of q. To get started, let's discuss a guide for integrating the rational function p of x over q of x when the degree of p is smaller than the degree of q. If necessary, we should factor q of x into a product of linear and irreducible quadratic terms. In other words, we should factor the denominator as much as possible. Next, we try to write p of x over q of x as a sum of terms where every linear factor ax plus b to the k in the denominator gives us a sum of k terms of the following form. Then each term corresponding to an irreducible quadratic, alpha x squared plus beta x plus gamma to the m, will yield a sum of m terms of the following form. After we've done this, we are going to solve for these unknown quantities, the a's, the c's, and the d's, by multiplying both sides by a common denominator and equating coefficients. The result is that we've written p of x over q of x as a sum of simpler rational functions, and then we integrate each of the simpler terms. Having seen a guide for integrating using partial fractions, we should now look at an example to see how it's done in practice. Suppose we're asked to integrate the rational function x squared plus x plus 8 divided by x minus 1 times x squared plus 4. In this question, we're lucky and the denominator has already been factored for us. We can also see that the degree in the top, which is 2, is smaller than the degree in the bottom, which is 3. So we can just go ahead and use the approach outlined in our guide. We should separate the expression using the factors in the bottom. The term x minus 1 in the bottom will give us a term a over x minus 1, and the term x squared plus 4 in the bottom will give us a term bx plus c over x squared plus 4. To figure out what a, b, and c are, we should multiply both sides of the equation by a common denominator. On the left-hand side, we should multiply by x minus 1 times x squared plus 4. 
And on the right-hand side, we should multiply by x minus 1 times x squared plus 4. We should then simplify the resulting equation. On the left, we get x squared plus x plus 8. And on the right, we get a times x squared plus 4 plus bx plus c times x minus 1. We now have the expression x squared plus x plus 8 equals a times x squared plus 4 plus bx plus c times x minus 1. The next step is to expand out. We get ax squared plus 4a plus bx squared minus bx plus cx minus c. We should then group together the quadratic terms, group together the linear terms, and group together the constant terms on the right. In order to find a, b, and c, we should compare the coefficients on the left with the coefficients on the right. Comparing quadratics gives 1 is equal to a plus b. Comparing linears gives 1 is equal to minus b plus c. And comparing constants gives 8 is equal to 4a minus c. We now solve the system of equations using substitution or elimination to get that a has to be 2, b has to be minus 1, and c has to be 0. Now that we know that a is 2, b is minus 1, and c is equal to 0, we can rewrite x squared plus x plus 8 divided by x minus 1 times x squared plus 4 as 2 over x minus 1 minus x over x squared plus 4. So we can now integrate x squared plus x plus 8 over x minus 1 times x squared plus 4 by splitting it into the two integrals the integral of 2 over x minus 1 minus the integral of x over x squared plus 4. The first integral is fairly straightforward, so we leave it alone. The second integral requires a substitution. We make the substitution u equals x squared plus 4, which means du is equal to 2x dx. And so we're left with 2 times the integral of 1 over x minus 1 dx minus a half the integral of 1 over u du. Integrating the first term gives us 2 log absolute value of x minus 1, while integrating the second term gives us minus a half log absolute value of u plus c. Substituting u equals x squared plus 4 gives us 2 log absolute value of x minus 1 minus 1 half log of x squared plus 4 plus c. So we conclude that the integral of x squared plus x plus 8 divided by x minus 1 times x squared plus 4 is equal to 2 log absolute value of x minus 1 minus 1 half log x squared plus 4 plus c. We have now seen some examples and discussed some guidelines for integrating rational functions using partial fractions where the degree in the top is smaller than the degree in the bottom. One might ask, what do you do when the degree in the top is larger than the degree in the bottom? The answer is to use long division and combine it with the method that we've already seen. Let's take a look at some examples and see how this is done. Let's discuss a guide for integrating rational functions p over q when the degree of p is greater than or equal to the degree of q. We should do long division to write p as g times q plus r, where g is a polynomial, r is a polynomial, and the degree of r is smaller than the degree of q. This means we can rewrite our rational function p over q in a much simpler form. We substitute in the expression that we get from long division for p, and then simplify. We get that p over q is equal to g, a polynomial, plus the rational function r over q. Since g is a polynomial, it's easy to integrate. And what's left over is a rational function. Note that r has smaller degree than q, so we can use our previous guide to integrate the rational function r over q. Let's take a look at how to use this guide in an example. Suppose we're asked to find the definite integral from 2 to 6 of the function x cubed minus x squared plus 1 divided by x squared minus x. This is a rational function, and if we look, we see that the degree in the top, 3, is larger than the degree in the bottom, 2. This means to get started, we need to do long division. I take the leading term of x squared minus x, 
and see how many times it divides the leading term of x cubed minus x squared plus 1. x cubed divided by x squared gives me x. I then multiply out and take the difference. This leaves me with 1. I now look at the leading term of x squared minus x and I see how many times it goes into this remainder. It doesn't go in at all and that tells me that I stop. So this tells me that I can write x cubed minus x squared plus 1 as x times x squared minus x plus the remainder of 1. Since we can write x cubed minus x squared plus 1 as x times x squared minus x plus 1, we can simplify our rational function. Subbing in the expression that we get from long division and then simplifying, we can write x cubed minus x squared plus 1 over x squared minus x as x plus 1 over x squared minus x. So now we have a rational function written as a polynomial plus a simpler rational function. In order to apply our partial fractions technique, we need to simplify 1 over x squared minus x. We should factor the denominator. That's fairly straightforward here. The bottom factors into x times x minus 1. The next step in our partial fraction technique is to separate the expression using the factors in the denominator. This allows us to write 1 over x times x minus 1 as a over x plus b over x minus 1. To solve for the values of a and b, we should multiply both sides of this equation by a common denominator. The common denominator is x times x minus 1, which gives us the following expression. We should now try to simplify on both sides. On the left hand side we get 1 and on the right hand side we get a times x minus 1 plus b times x. Expanding out we get 1 is equal to ax minus a plus bx. Grouping together the linear terms and the constant terms we can now equate the coefficients. Looking at the linear terms, I get that a plus b should equal 0, because there's no linear term on the left, and 1 should equal minus a. Solving for a and b, we get that a is minus 1, and b is equal to plus 1. Since a is minus 1 and b is plus 1, we get the following expression for 1 over x squared minus x. It's equal to minus 1 over x, plus 1 over x minus 1. As a result, we can now split up the original integral. The integral of x cubed minus x squared plus 1 divided by x squared minus x can be split into the integral of x plus the integral of 1 over x squared minus x, and that can be further split up into the integral of x plus the integral of minus 1 over x plus 1 over x minus 1. Now that we have simpler integrals, we just need to compute them. Integrating x will give us x squared over 2, while integrating minus 1 over x will give us minus logarithm absolute value x, and integrating 1 over x minus 1 will give us logarithm absolute value of x minus 1. We need to evaluate these from x equals 2 to x equals 6 since we're computing a definite integral. Before evaluating, let's simplify the expression a bit. We get x squared over 2 and then we get a term by combining the logarithms. We get logarithm absolute x minus 1 over x. Now we just need to evaluate the antiderivative at x equals 6 and x equals 2. We plug in x equals 6 and we subtract the value that we get by plugging in x equals 2. We simplify and after simplifying we see that the answer is 16 plus the logarithm of 5 over 3. So we conclude that the integral from 2 to 6 of x cubed minus x squared plus 1 divided by x squared minus x is equal to 16 plus the logarithm of 5 thirds. Let's look at another example. Suppose we're asked to integrate 7x squared minus 12x plus 13 over x minus 2 squared times 4x squared plus 1. To begin, we compare the degree in the top with the degree in the bottom. The degree in the top is 2 and the degree in the bottom is 4. Since the degree in the top is smaller than the degree in the bottom, 
we do not need to do long division, and we can proceed with the partial fraction technique. Also notice that the bottom is already completely factored. The term 4x squared plus 1 is an irreducible quadratic. So to begin, we need to separate the expression using the factors in the denominator. Notice that the factor x minus 2 squared will contribute two terms since the exponent is 2. The term x minus 2 squared will contribute a over x minus 2 plus b over x minus 2 squared, while the term 4x squared plus 1 will contribute the term cx plus d over 4x squared plus 1. The next step is to multiply both sides of the equation by a common denominator in order to solve for a, b, c, and d. This means on the left and the right, we should multiply by the term x minus 2 squared times 4x squared plus 1. We should then simplify the resulting equation, leaving a 7x squared minus 12x plus 13 on the left-hand side, while on the right-hand side, after we simplify, we get the following complicated expression. The next step is to equate the coefficients in order to solve for a, b, c, and d. Comparing the terms with x cubed on the left and the right, we get the equation 0 is equal to 4a plus c, because there are no x cubes on the left, while the coefficients of x cubed on the right is 4a plus c. Next we move to the x squared terms. On the left hand side we have 7, and on the right hand side we have minus 8a plus 4b minus 4c plus d. We now compare the coefficient of x. On the left hand side we have minus 12, and on the right hand side we have a plus 4c plus 4d. Finally, we compare the constant terms. On the left hand side we have 13, and on the right hand side we have minus 2a plus b plus 4d. We now have a system of equations for a, b, c, and d which we can solve. Solving this system of equations gives us a equals 0, b equals 1, c equals 0, and d equals 3. As a result, we can write the rational function 7x squared minus 12x plus 13 divided by x minus 2 squared times 4x squared plus 1 as 1 over x minus 2 squared plus 3 over 4x squared plus 1. We're now ready to integrate. Our work has shown us that we should integrate 1 over x minus 2 squared plus 3 over 4x squared plus 1. The first step is to split it into two terms, the integral of 1 over x minus 2 squared plus 3 times the integral of 1 over 4x squared plus 1. We're going to focus on the second term. In order to integrate 1 over 4x squared plus 1, we have to make a substitution u equals 2x, which results in du equals 2dx. As a result, we're left with the integral of 1 over x minus 2 squared dx plus 3 halves the integral of 1 over u squared plus 1 du. Integrating the first term gives us minus 1 over x minus 2, while integrating 1 over u squared plus 1 gives us arctangent of u plus c. So we get minus 1 over x minus 2 plus 3 halves arctangent of u plus c. However, we have to substitute back in u equals 2x. As a result, we're able to conclude that the integral of 7x squared minus 12x plus 13 over x minus 2 squared times 4x squared plus 1 is equal to minus 1 over x minus 2 plus 3 halves arctangent of 2x plus c. To summarize, the method of partial fractions can be used to integrate rational functions. We have seen that terms with repeated factors that can be tricky, and that irreducible quadratics require a little bit extra work. However, we hope that with some practice you will learn to master this technique. We've compiled a list of additional practice problems to help you get started. Good luck, and thanks for watching.